Good evening. Uh, it is Monday, May 3rd, 2021. Um, under Governor Baker's March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, this allows us to hold this virtual town council meeting. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I am calling the meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. I'll call upon each councilor by name at that time. They're going to unmute and say present, and then they will mute again. Um, this meeting includes audio, video, and is available live on Amherst Media. There is no chat room. If you have technical issues, please let Athena or me know, and we will make note of that and either pause the meeting or if, ha if necessary, go on with it. Um, Athena will be monitoring counselors' connections. And uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and call the roll. Um, I'm going to start with Alyssa Brewer. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Darcy DeMont. Present. Uh, Lynn Griesmer is present. And Mandy Johanneke. Present. Dorothy Pam. Present. Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Steve Schreiber. Here. Andy Steinberg. Andy, can you? Present. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Schwartz. Present. And Shalini Balmilne. I'm here. Ah, oh, there you are. Thank you. Um, we are going to uh, continue on with a couple of announcements and we're going to show those on the screen. I just want to point out to the audience a couple of key hearings that are coming up. One is on the proposed budget, and that will be joint with the Finance Committee on the 17th. Another on the 24th is when we will hold the required hearing on, on the North Common. And then let me also point out that there will be a joint public hearing uh, with the Community Resources Committee and the Planning Board regarding um, Article 15, includes, including inclusionary zoning and the temporary moratorium. And that will be on May 19th at seven and eight o'clock respectively. The Finance Committee also will have a number of seriously long and serious debate over the budget. That calendar can be found on the town website and I just wanna make note that the meetings begin at one, not the normal two o'clock, giving the council more time. Uh, and if counselors that are not on the finance committee wish to attend, please let Athena know as far in advance as possible so that if we need to call a committee of the whole, we can do so. I also wanna point out while there is a GOL meeting on May 5th, there is no TSO meeting, Town Services and Outreach Committee meeting. It has been canceled on May 6th. One other quick announcement we're gonna show you, and that is um, we urge you to help honor high school graduates. Uh, and they have a link that you can get to through the Amherst Regional High School um, website. It allows you to order signs, honor a graduate. We're going to move on. There is no hearing tonight. Our next area is public comment. And let me just mention, this is one of two public comment periods tonight. This is the time for general public comment. Later, there is a special public comment period associated with the regional school budget. So with that, um, residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. 
um, based on the number of people who wish to speak. And I will ask for people to raise their hands momentarily. Kathy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just had a request, Lynn, on for the hearing on the North Commons. Is it possible that we can post the diagram somewhere where people can find them of the two plan options? I just checked and engaged Amherst, they're not up yet. Um, so that's just a great quest. We're, it's, they're working on it. Thank you very much. Uh, I know Brianna just made one update already today with regard to zoning. Um, so the council will not engage in dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment. To, to participate, please raise your hand. At this point, I see three hands. Uh, first one is Zoe Crabtree. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi everybody, my name is Zoe Crabtree and I live in District 5. Um, firstly, uh, I want to just say that only being able to look at the budget for a couple minutes ahead of this is a little bit frustrating, but my first takes at uh, looking at the executive summary and um, the very helpful little chart at the beginning, thanks for adding that, um, is that uh, I am very excited to see that there is funding for the CREST program, which I think is really lovely. Uh, however, uh, it is only the $130,000 that was taken from frozen positions from the police department um, that you all froze uh, last year, uh, which is drastically less than the $2.2 million that the CSWG requested uh, to fully fund and support this program. Um, so I would urge everybody on this call to consider uh, how such a program could be successful um, with such little funding compared to the budget that was uh, devised for it to run. Um, and that's what I will say on that today. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, we have caller 0810. Please identify yourself and where you live. It's star six to unmute. Yes, okay, so I'm here. This is uh, Vincent O'Connor. Is this an appropriate time to make a comment? Yes, Vince, we can hear you. Go ahead, please. Okay, so um, I would like to renew a request I made, I think almost two years ago, that the, that the council appoint a, an Amherst refugee and asylum applicant resettlement commission. Um, um, at, at the point that I made the request, there was multiple litigation against the various facilities that were being used to house immigrants um, in really, really poor conditions. And we had a very unfriendly federal administration. We now have a much friendlier federal administration, and but a substantially different situation um, where there are many um, unaccompanied um, minors who have um, applied for either refugee status or, or asylum in the United States. And um, I think it, I know that there are individuals who would like to do something. In fact, I, I have spoken to a four or five Spanish speaking residents of the town who would be willing to serve on such a commission. Um, but really finding a way for people to, to, to express their interest in, in housing um, somebody who is seeking refuge or asylum in the United States, I think is impossible for an individual to do. But if there were a, local, um, a municipal commission that could solicit interest, interview um, interested parties, um, and make a brief, you know, report to the council that could be forwarded to the appropriate federal agency saying, we have interviewed so many people, there appear to be so many slots available, um, please consider us. Um, and for, uh, you know, 
for people who don't have relatives in the United States, and we don't know how many there are of those those folks. I mean, the problems that have been that are the re, that have resulted in these refugee and in asylum claims um, are, you know, longstanding. Um, we all know the United States' involvement in Central Central America, a very tragic and sad history. And um, and as much as we decry the history, we have an obligation to try to do something as individuals. And I I think that a a municipal commission would would be able to accomplish what what individuals cannot do. And I would ask the council to refer the matter to the appropriate committee, inform me of when the committee would meet. And I would be happy to attend by Zoom, I suppose, to a committee meeting, provide them in writing with a proposal, and um, see if we could move forward and the names of people who are willing to volunteer so that they could be have some guarantee that if a committee were established, it wouldn't be a half a year before there were enough volunteers. Vince, we so, want to thank you for your comment. Your time is up. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Joanne Morse. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please state your name and where you live. Hi, I'm Joanna Morse. I live on Potwine Lane in Amherst. Um, it's nice to see many of you um, who have been at many meetings within the past. I was really disappointed to see that my signature was not counted for the petition to put the library decision to voters. Um, it was really interesting to have that example of voter dis disenfranchisement become so personal. For a small thing, I mean a petition, although not a small decision about how we spend our money as a town, um, but I'm really shocked that um, signatures seem to have been randomly um, or at least without much explanation, um, not, not considered valid to bring the number of the petitioners right below the required number that was needed. I ask that you um, that you reconsider that, that you um, follow through with seeing our affidavits. I've signed an affidavit saying that, yes, this is actually me. I've lived in the same place for 13 years in Amherst. I know many of you, and I would like to not have my signature not counted as a voter in town. Um, and I know that I'm not alone in being just a resident of town who signed that petition and what was not counted. Um, so I look forward to hearing your response about that when it's appropriate, thanks. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Bailey, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, um, can people hear me? Great, Hello. my name is Bailey Batty. I live on North Whitney Street. Um, I would like to start by reminding the town council that last year during the budget process, you asked for research and you asked for somewhere to move APD money to so that it wouldn't be lost from the budget. Um, the community safety working group have worked to some pretty intense deadlines to give you this alternative to do this research and have been given, according to my map, which is often wrong, please feel free to check me on this, what looks like 6% of the budget that they have asked for for this initiative for the CREST program. Um, and the police budget has actually slightly increased, I think. Um, this is setting the CREST program up to fail. They have proposed some really great things. They have done this research, but if they are not, like if the CREST program is not able to be run in a way that like can actually be successful, then of course it's going to look like this is not successful and like this is a failed initiative and that this isn't something we should be worth we, we should be working on. Um, in addition to asking you to fully fund the CREST program, I would also urge you not to cut the budget of one of the hardest hit and most important town services, our schools. Uh, school staff have been working exponentially harder this year and the past year, um, in some cases for less pay and while risking, frankly, their lives in some of these situations um, to perform some pretty impossible things. I 
don't really like the phrasing that students are behind on things because it sort of makes it sound like education is a competition and I don't, I don't agree with that. Um, but it is definitely clear that students have struggled socially and academically through this pandemic. And for several years coming after this now, they are going to need significantly more support, not less support from paras, from ELL services, from special education services. In conclusion, the proposed budget for the police department, the schools, and the wildly small percentage of the CREST program are uh, are going to continue to perpetuate and increase the harm done to our BIPOC, houseless, and student populations in Amherst. Um, please consider taking money from the police budget to fully fund both the CRESS program and our school budgets. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Bailey. Uh, Maria Capetti, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, my name is Maria Capetti. I live in South Amherst. Uh, I'm speaking tonight in support of a thorough review of the certification process of the recent petition by Amherst voters. This resulted in the erroneous rejection of dozens of signatures of registered voters. The subject of the petition is irrelevant to the issue at hand. The particular ask of a petition may make you furious, it may make you ecstatic, or you could give not a wit about it one way or the other. The issue here is that a petition had numerous signatures rejected in error, and this resulted in that petition being denied. The petitioners have asked the appropriate bodies to review those rejections and correct these mistakes. Whatever one thinks or wants relative to the subject of the petition, we should all be concerned when people are disenfranchised. It's not only the individuals whose signatures were rejected in error who were affected, every person signed the petition was negatively impacted when the petition was erroneously certified. If not rectified, every resident in town will have been denied their right to vote. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Maria. Um, Mona Shadi, please state your name and where you live. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. My name is Mona Shetty. I currently live in East Hampton, but I have lived and worked in Amherst for many years. Um, I am calling tonight because I am a former ELL student and I am deeply dismayed at the cuts that I see um, in the new proposed budget. Um, I thought that maybe sort of talking about some of my experiences might help, but I have been out of ELL for 30 years. And when I look around me, I see that access to those classes are not thriving, they're dwindling. And um, I'm very, very concerned about that. Um, one of the things I would like to put past you is an analogy that really helped me a lot in understanding the dynamics of town funding. And that's, um, and what I'd like to do is compare uh, the police department to the ambulance department. Um, excuse me. Uh, the police force is unique because they are the only public servants who are armed. Yet just as ambulance services act as the emergency room arm of our health system, police act as the emergency arm of our justice system. And they are armed because they cannot prevent violence. They can only meet or respond, act to deter or neutralize it, which is why they are armed and why ambulances at the same time have intubation and oxygen equipment. We don't ask ambulances to prevent car accidents or heart attacks. We ask them to respond after trauma has taken place. We know that preventing heart attacks and car accidents requires the work of several agencies, the public and departments. It requires a focus on integration, safety, quality of life, research and changes where needed. This is the job of our community. Uh, if we want a healthy and secure community, we need to look at it holistically, asking emergency workers to ensure a community of fulfilled, healthy and thriving people is like expecting EMTs to address the causes of cancer. We know that there are experts and doctors and nurses, and we have, um, excuse me, let's leave the health prevention to them. And let's leave the idea that more police equals a safe and thriving community. There are experts in this field. We need to defund the police and reallocate those resources to them. And certainly um, the people that stand to lose the most, the uh, interpreters, the paras, the teachers, the art teachers, these are the people that we need to be nourishing. Um, and, uh, I would like to ask that we defund the Amherst Police Department in order to um, fund the CREST program 
and um, to take that community, to take our community service budget out of 6% where it's been stagnant for the last few years. Um, I thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments, Mona. Lydia Irons, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. My name is Lydia Irons. I live on Jeffrey Lane in Amherst, and I'm making a comment tonight to ask you to fully fund the Crest program at the 2.2 million that they asked for in their unbelievably well put together and well-researched proposal. Um, I'd like you all to remember back to the bu budget hearings that we had last year, where many of you talked about if we had an alternative, we could maybe think about it. And then this amazing group of people came together and worked so hard for a very small amount of money and put so much of their own blood, sweat, and tears into this proposal. And um, to have, you know, 6% of that in this budget um, is, is, is pretty insulting. Um, I also would like to point out that on page 65 of the budget that um, the public got maybe an hour, two hours before this meeting. Um, on page 65, the public safety is 44% of the budget in that pie chart. So 44% is for public safety, but we can't even provide the Crest program what they asked for for their pilot. Um, I find that pretty enraging. Also, there's some very upsetting language in there. Um, quote, no other community in mass has such a program. This is ridiculously self-congratulatory if you're not going to fully fund the program that was put together by the Community Safety Working Group. 93.6% um, of calls to the APD are for nonviolent uh, nonviolent calls, and that would be answered by the CREST program in theory. So if 93.6% of calls would be going to this pilot program, yet you are only giving them 130K, you are setting them up for failure. Um, so I am going to ask you to, when you see this budget presentation tonight, um, reject it and fully fund the CREST program for what they asked for. Thank you for your comments, Lydia. Allegra? Please enter the room, state your full name and where you live. Allegra, you need to unmute. Athena, can we help her? I've sent a request to unmute. Okay, Allegra, you've received a request to unmute. Please do so. Um, Allegra, Allegra, let's try one more time. Please unmute your mic. Is there any further instruction we can give her, Athena? No, if she's not at her keyboard, she might not see that request. I see, okay. Uh, then let's put her back into the attendees and we'll see if it works later, okay? Uh, Lauren. Please enter the room. State your full name and where you live. Lauren, you need to unmute. I'm sorry, my hand was not supposed to be raised. Sorry. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Are there any other comments at this time? Allegra, did you figure out how to unmute? Okay, are there any other comments at this time? Uh, Lydia, you spoke, already spoke, so I wanna go to Adrian Teresi.
Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Good evening and thank you, Lynn. Thank you, town councilors. My name is Adrian Terizzi. I do live in District 5. And tonight I'm speaking on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Amherst. Previously, I had attended, and I'm speaking tonight about the District Advisory Board, uh, which is coming before you later on. I have to say as background that I attended the April 7th and the April 21st meeting of the GOL committee, and I was pleased to hear their deliberations on a draft that the League of Women Voters was unable to, to support at that point in time. The official position of the League of Women Voters is that we believe in the responsibility for districting preferably should be vested in an independent special commission. So with that having been said, I want to thank and hats off to the GOL for presenting to the town council tonight an independent commission composed of nine, nine elected resident members who will come from the districts within the town. I also commend the GOL on the timeline that you've presented. Although we don't expect census data block specific precinct level information until the, uh, until the end of the September, early reading is it could be arriving by the end of this month. So you, I love your charge. Uh, aside from that, the charge, the composition of the committee, your very effective timelines to get us up and running uh, with census block data by the end of the month is all speaks well for our town in getting us to a redrawing of district maps that are contiguous, uh, compact, and include communities of interest. And just with one more thing, I hope that town council will also entertain on behalf of the residents of Amherst an opportunity to take a look at the maps that you've redrawn. Please allow us at least one public hearing. I know in past years during redistricting, people have said, have comment, uh, why do I have a precinct change? What's this all about? I like my old polling place. And I think if we all work together and inform voters that redistricting is happening, that indeed we can have our individual input into how we draw our maps and then do outreach to inform everyone as to what's taking place and why, then it's a win-win. So I'll conclude by saying, GOL, terrific work. I really enjoyed listening to your two uh, meetings. Thank you for accepting my public comments. And on behalf of the League of Women Voters, let's do this together. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Amara. Uh, please enter the room, state your name, and where you live. Hi, my name is Amara Donovan, and I live on Amity Street. I'm extremely disappointed to see the lack of funding for the Crest program using only the frozen police positions while seeing an increase in the police budget itself. This shows a clear lack of priority in centering our BIPOC residents and in honoring their lived experiences as valuable data when making decisions about our town. It's a check the box response to the critical needs of our community and is incredibly racist and oppressive. If any of you have followed the history of this town beyond Jeffrey Amherst, you know that this is not new. Generation after generation of BIPOC community members have served on committee after committee, have been subjected to trauma over and over again, and then ignored over and over again until the work is forgotten and started all over. Investment is a direct reflection of our values in this town, and we continue to fail black and brown residents, families, and young people. It's extremely disturbing to see the funding spent on other things in our town, like $117 a day on gas for police officers to circle our town day after day, surveilling black and brown residents at alarming rates. Even investing in the library as a building before we invest in the safety and well-being of black and brown people, children, families is ridiculous. And again, is a clear reflection of the values today, those of the values those in leadership in our town today have, which can also be reflected on this very Zoom in the sheer absence of black and brown people on the council and in leadership positions. This is a problem. Even the police themselves expressed publicly on a community safety working group meeting that they would be, quote, dancing in the street, unquote, if they didn't have to handle nonviolent calls, the majority of all calls made to our police department. 
we must defund the police and invest in our BIPOC community based on the needs and solutions they identify. That is equity and that is anti-racism and Amherst is falling behind. Thank you. Mara, thank you for your comments. Allegra, you've already spoken once today and so I'm actually going to uh, Hello? Go, go on to- She hasn't spoken. Yeah, she... Has not... Oh, I'm sorry. Allegra, you are the person that we were not able to unmute. Please enter the room and my apologies. Allegra, can, there you go. Hi, Hi. Hi. can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sorry about that. Um, I was just joining. My name is Allegra. I am a resident of Amherst. I live in District 2. And I was just right, I uh, wanted to say that I hope that the town council will fully fund the CRESS program as the community service working group has put it forward at the $2.2 million with money reallocated from the police budget. It's my understanding that the two frozen positions from last year are being diverted into the community services budget to cover this and that there is an additional position that it just become, became vacant last week. Um, and if that is in fact the case that that also be frozen and reallocated towards the CRESS program. Um, additionally, I'm interested to hear more about if money did come down from the stimulus package to fund education and if that would mean that we wouldn't be looking at cuts there. And if we still are looking at cuts in the schools that we again think about reallocating funding away from the police because it has been a really difficult year for children and to take away supports and basically enriching activities for them, I think is the wrong move. Um, so that's what I wanna say. And I hope you have a good evening. Allegra, thanks for your persistence and we're glad you could join us and unmute your phone. And thanks for your comment. Are there any other comments at this time? Okay, then we are going to go on to the consent agenda, which will show on the screen. Uh, I just want to note. Adrian, did you have your hand up or did you just not put it down? Okay. We're going to go on to the consent agenda. Um, The following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonably to expect they would pass with no controversy. After I read the items, please let me know if you would like to have an item removed. Removal of an item does not require a second. So I'm going to go ahead and read this as a motion and then I'll be looking for a second to move the following items and the printed motions thereunder and approve those items as a single unit. 6A, waive waiver of town council rules of procedure, rule 8.6 for agenda item 6.A, Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month Proclamation. 6A, adoption of the Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month Proclamation. 8B, Referral of the FY22 budget to the Finance Committee. 8C, referral of the FY22 Capital Improvement Program to Finance Committee. 9A, approval of town manager reappointments to Affordable Housing Trust and Human Rights Commission. And 11, approval of minutes. March 25th, 2021, Joint Town Council and Town Services and Outreach Committee meeting minutes, public forum on Pomeroy Village intersection, March 27th, Joint Town Council and Town Services and Outreach Committee meeting meetings, committee, committee meeting minutes, public forum on Pomeroy Village intersection, April 5th, Special Town Council meeting minutes, public forum on library appropriations, April 5th, 2021, regular Town Council meeting minutes, and April 12th, regular town council meeting minutes. Is there a second? Second, Ross. 
Thank you. Is there any item that anybody would like to have removed? Okay, seeing no hands, I'm going to begin the voting uh, with Shalini Baumill. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Aye. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Aye. Evan Ross. Aye. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Aye. Passes unanimously 13 0, 0 and no absences. We're going to move on to the next agenda item, which at the request of the GOL, we are going to have a new practice, and that is given the um, item of the uh, Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month proclamation. George Ryan will say a few words about it. George. Thank you, Lynn. Um, first, just a very brief thank you to Jen Moyston um, for bringing this to the council's attention and providing us with an initial draft. Uh, the council this evening is seeking to honor and recognize the contributions of residents from Asia, India, and the Pacific Islands, and so therefore uh, proclaims the month of May as Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and we ask you, the public, to join us in the town's first Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month virtual celebration on Monday, May 17th, 2021 at 5 p.m. Thank you so much, George. And that will be a new practice of the council so that we uh, recognize proclamations it, besides just listing them. Uh, we're going to move on to presentations. First one is an update on the library. And I'm going to call on town manager, Paul Bachman. So thank you, Lynn. So a lot has happened since your vote um, on April 5th to fund the library. So at, at your meeting, you voted to authorize borrowing to fund the expansion and renovation of the Jones Library. Subsequent to that town council vote, residents initiated a petition to trigger section 8.4 of the Amherst Home Rule Charter, Charter that provides for a voter veto protesting against the measure approved by the town council. To initiate this process, the petitioners needed to submit a petition physically, quote, physically signed by a minimum of 5% of the registered voters as of the date of the most recent town election, close quote. The town clerk determined that this number was 864 signatures. The petitioners had 14 days following the date on which the town council had voted to approve the, the measure. However, the 14th day was on Monday, April 19th, which is a holiday. So due to that holiday, the deadline became Tuesday, April 20th at 5 p.m. The town clerk's office received all signatures submitted by 5 p.m. and uh, on that deadline and certified 842 signatures. The office received 12 written statements in proper form from voters who asked that their names not be certified. However, only two withdrawal letters were received prior to the filing of the petition, which is required for withdrawal. So only two were not certified. Because 864 votes signatures were required and 842 were submitted, the petition failed to produce enough signatures of registered voters to trigger the next step in section 8.4 of the Home Rule Charter. A legal complaint was filed in Superior Court requesting, among other things, to extend the period of time for collecting signatures, to reduce the number of signatures required to 50% of the charter requirement, and to provide for the submission of electronic signatures. A hearing was held in Superior Court in Northampton on, on Wednesday, April 28th. The town was represented by the town attorney, Lauren Goldberg. In a detailed legal decision, the judge denied the complaint. I have submitted to the MBLC a certified copy of the town council vote and a signed contract and associated documents for the first disbursement prior to the April 30th, 2021 deadline to meet the, to meet the schedule that we have established. Um, so that's the update on where we are today. Okay. Are there counselor questions at this time? Darcy Dumont, you have your hand up. 
Yeah, um, I just w wondered if you could give us an update on the <clears throat> status of the petitioner request um, uh, appeal uh, to the Board of Registrars with regard to the names, additional names that they got affidavits for. Sure. Um, so the um, the deadline for, for submitting those affidavits is tomorrow, Tuesday at 5 p.m. So the town attorney had recommended to the um, clerk to not call a meeting of the Board of Registrars until 48 hours after that deadline. And I think they're looking at scheduling a meeting for the Board of Registrars for Friday um, at some point, I don't know the exact time, but I know they were working together to get a quorum of the Board of Registrars to be able to review the request um, that was before them. Okay. And, and we, do, I, I, we do have a legal opinion from the town attorney, which I can share with you about what the number of issues that have been raised by the petitioners at this point in time that will help guide the decision making of the registrars at that point in time. Alyssa? Thank you, um, and thank you for answering that. So to follow up on another aspect of something that you mentioned, I know that several days before the petition deadline, people had contacted us and said they weren't clear on what they were signing. It wasn't that they thought one thing and then changed their minds, it's that they didn't understand what they were signing. And so we gave them a form to fill out and you said that X number of those, we keep hearing different numbers. We heard 20 at one point, well, now we're hearing 12, then we're hearing two. And I'm wondering if we gave adequate information to the people who told us they wanted to do that because I'm hearing you now say they had to have them in before the petitions were filed. I believed at one point we said they had to have them in before the deadline for the petitions to be filed. So I don't understand if those larger numbers we're hearing about from individuals out in the community were because, you know, I don't know what time the petitions were filed, but say they were filed at three o'clock, that people didn't turn their their withdrawals in until 345. I just would like you to clarify that because we've just got a lot of confusion out there about that issue as well as yeah. the other issue. So at the time that the, um, the town clerk uh, certified the signatures, the 12, had been received by the office. More came in sub subsequent to that date, but at that point, she had already said, determined that those there weren't enough signatures to move to the next stage. Um, and it is one of those things where it's like, if the petition comes in first and you come in the next, you're the next person in line, you say, I wanna withdraw my signature, it's too late. That petition has already come in. They timestamp everything in the office. And that was the situation for the majority of people who asked to have their, their signatures removed. The process for the Board of Registrars is to start to look at if there, were, if there was any fraud or anything like that in terms of signing, signing the documents. Yeah. Alyssa, did you have a follow-up question? Okay, Dorothy? Yes. Um, as you know, I voted to support the library, but I'm in my had a lot of experience with the um, Board of Registrars in New York City, and I'm we the protocol would be to take a signature on a petition and compare it to the voter card, not to a voter list. And in all the conversation I'm hearing, it's very unclear to me what the process was at our registrar's office. Were those signatures compared to the voter cards, because there it doesn't matter if a signature is legible as long as it matches. So I'm not an expert in this area. Uh, they have a very, the Secretary of State has issued a long sheet, and I can share that out with you, that details exactly what the, whoever the clerk is who has access to the voter uh, registration information system that the town clerk, that the uh, State Secretary of the Commonwealth maintains. Uh, they have to go follow a strict protocol. They do not look at the, the they, they're not handwriting experts. They're not, they're trying to say that's a signature or not a signature. They're trying, there are certain rules that they have to follow. And our town clerk has experience doing hundreds of petitions. Your, all of your nomination papers, they go through this all the time. They follow the exact same rules. Um, and it's an independent office and they go about their business and this is what they come out with. Okay. So it was according to some state protocol. I will send you the protocol. Yes, okay, I can do that you. to the council. Thank you. Uh, Steve Schreiber. Yeah, so I'm gonna continue a conversation that just happened, but I too am concerned about voter 
disenfranchisement, and I'm concerned about those people who in good faith tried to have their names withdrawn. So we all know that the town clerk sent a actual email to somebody that was copied to a number of us, including me, that basically said, here's the form, you must email it, fax it, or drop it in the Dropbox. There was no deadline given. Others trying to be helpful gave a deadline being April 20th, because we knew that that was the deadline for the petition. So lots of people, we, we know that there's at least 10, but we think there's many more have tried to take their names off the petition through a good faith. And I'm very concerned that they, that their desire to have their names withdrawn is being disenfranchised. So voter enfranchisement is a two-way street and we need to make sure that it's known that it's a two-way street. Um, also, and with all due respect, even right here, we've heard different deadlines given and I do respect to the town manager, but I think at one point you said the deadline was when the petitions were filed and another time you said when they're certified. Um, you, that's very nuanced. In other words, I personally don't even know the until now what the difference between those are, but certainly if I am a voter in good faith, trying to do the right thing, I signed a petition by mistake, I want to have my name took, taken off. I don't know the difference between filed and certified. I don't know that town hall is closed on Monday. I leave it in the drop box like I'm told. And it's like a uh, somebody happens to come on the front door of the town hall and get their petition timestamp before the town clerk is able to pick up the withdrawal forms. That sounds like, that does not sound right to me. So, so that's where I stand on this. Thank you, Steve. Are there any other or comments at this time? Darcy? Yeah, I just wondered, Paul, if you could let us know what, what are the legal issues that KP Law is, is uh, looking at about the, um, the, the Board of Registrar's hearing. I can, um, I can send you the opinion that uh, she has written uh, for the, and which has been shared. I believe it's been, I think the clerk has shared it with the board of registrars. You can share it with the council if you'd like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, um, you know, and I, what I didn't say is that the, um, with the original uh, complaint that went to the um, superior court last Wednesday and the judge issued a decision on Friday, that ha the, the plaintiffs have the ability to appeal that decision to superior court to wherever they appeal it to. So that is still an option as well. Darcy, you, you still have your hand up. I'm wondering how, how will the public find out what those issues are um, that KP Law is looking at? Um, we can add it to this to the meetings packet um, if you'd like. That would be good. That would be yeah. good. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I just want to be clear that my job as town manager is first to make sure that the town charter is, the, is honored and that that's, you know, the, that's what the vote of the people have done. And so that was the first order of business. And my second order of business is to carry out the, the votes of the town council. So those are the two um, uh, ways I look at my, the actions that we take as, as in, in town hall. Are there any other questions from the council? Okay, then we are going to go on to the next item. And let me just say, um, I wanna make note on the agenda that this was posted at the last minute. It is the item refer referred to as the application for municipality opt out of state Reclamation and Mosquito Control Board spring. Our goal tonight is not to debate the merits of this. It is only to learn from Paul how we as a town are going to follow a process to try to get to the point that we make the right decision to move forward. So Paul, would you talk about that please? Sure, so there's, this has received a fair amount of um, interest in the community. So there is a new law under the law, the state is given expanded authority to engage in mosquito control, and that's usually called aerial spraying, only after the Department of Public Health declares that there's an elevated risk of arbovirus virus. 
uh, DPH must publicly publish the data supporting this declaration. Under that authority, the State Reclamation and Mosquito Control Board can then be active throughout the state. This includes public education, standing water drainage, ground larva site application, and other steps in addition to aerial pesticide spraying. Before any spraying, there must be at least 48 hours advance notice to the public, including notice to local boards of health, property owners who have opted out of spraying, and farms, including beekeepers and certified organic farms. Anyone can use an online form if they want to, to be informed of aerial spraying in their region. The notice will include a process for people to opt out of spraying. Cities and cities and towns, which is us, can also opt, opt out entirely from pesticide, pesticide spraying. If they wish to opt out, however, they must have an approved alternative mosquito management plan. Uh, there is an overall directive, directive in the bill that all actions taken under the authority of this section shall be designate, designed to protect public health while minimizing to the extent feasible any adverse impact on the environment. So in the, this, no one can recall when there's been aerial spraying in the town of Amherst um, in recent memory in the last few decades from everyone I've talked with. Um, there was one incident of aerial spraying in, last year, which was in Plymouth County. Um, and they went through all the process, but this is a different thing. It changes the rules. And so um, the, the challenge for the town is that in, or if you want to opt out according to the current rules, you have to notify uh, the state Re reclamation board and mosquito control board by May 15th, which is a Saturday. Um, I've asked the health director to initiate the process for opting out and preparing a substitute plan. Um, that would then go to, the, to you, the town council for your action. It requires the town council to act to opt out. Um, in this required all, but in, for, in order for you to opt out, you have to have an alternative mosquito management plan um, and receive the advice and do a, receive the advice of the Board of Health and listen to the public, things like that. Um, so I have contacted state officials uh, at, the, at the board. Uh, so there's a call today that we were alerted to and that, that we, we listened in on. Um, and also contacted our state senator and state representative to get an extension of time so we have the time to create the alternative management plan. These things are not small or easy things that we can just take off the shelf. And we're not, and we found on this call and from our state legislators that we're not the only community doing this. Dozens, dozens and dozens of communities have the same concerns that we have. Um, so we're moving to extend the deadline and failing that, our goal is to get a, I've talked with the, the council president about having a special meeting of the council to be able to act on this prior to May 15th. Um, whether we can be in a position to have the information that you're gonna need to make an informed decision is unclear. A town, the town, the, the public health director is looking into this from looking how other communities have done it. Um, most communities, many communities are part of larger mosquito control districts and they don't really have to address it because they're part of the district. We're not part of a district. We could join a district if we so chose, but there's a con you have to pay to join in these districts. So that's the sort of lay of the land. Um, and um, we will move, you know, the first order of business. And I talked with our the staff of the state senator's office to expedite a decision on whether they will extend our request or not. Uh, they've received lots of requests for extension of times. So we're hoping that they will grant that. That will give us time to get the information we need to make a, a coherent presentation to the council. Other questions? Yes, Pat. I'm just wondering if um, you don't hear back from the state and or they say no extension, can we respond by the 15th? Yes, I talked with the council president. She estimated that she was going to see if we could call a, if she could call a town council meeting on May 13th, which is a finance committee meeting, maybe immediately prior. She, I know she's talked with the finance committee chair on that. I think that's the backup plan is to take, take that date as a date for the council to act. Let me just expand. I have talked with um, the chair of the finance committee meeting we would do a poll and see whether or not we can have a sufficient number of counselors present to meet at noon on the 13th, if, if need be. Hopefully we don't have to go that route. Hopefully we get the extension and we have a much greater opportunity to look at this with reasonable input from the public. Alyssa. 
So I wanted to bring up two things. One is that we, as some of us will recall and others might not, we have a nine non-binding resolution on pollinators that we passed last spring, which is on our resolution page. And so we should be taking that into account when we explain our plan, since we've already gone on record as saying that. And the second thing I wanna point out is I really appreciate that we are attempting to extend the deadline and that we are not alone. And at the same time, I will point out that Senator Comerford's office advised us of this program on March 19th. And we've had several town council meetings since then and had no idea that this needed to be dealt with by May 15th, even though, and, and hadn't been, um, even though we received that information back in March. So I appreciate that it's a new law and that it wasn't something we'd had experience with and that we're not part of a district. So I realized the many levels of complication for this. So I'm hoping that the board, I'm disappointed to see the Board of Health doesn't appear to be taking it up this week on their agenda that they posted after this issue was brought to their attention. And I realized that we're now scrambling. So I hope they'll scramble a little bit too, to be as supportive as they can of make, moving this forward, given Amherst history. Thanks, Alyssa. George. Yeah, um, my understanding is the Board of Health does not meet this week, but meets on the 13th. Now maybe they've changed their date or maybe I misread the calendar, but I checked. And my understanding is they meet on the 13th. Um, does somebody know for a fact that they meet this week? Because my fact is the 13th. So if it is the 13th, that's the that very day that, no, it is going to be this week? Oh. Yeah, so they have scheduled a special meeting for this week, right. initially to talk about mask. They have a, a local mask um, requirement that is out of step with the, the state's requirement about mask wearing at this point. Um, they have. I haven't looked at the agenda, but my understanding from the health directors that they did not put the um, the mosquito control thing on their agenda this week. But the health director felt she had enough ability to move forward on doing the research that needed to be done prior to your May 13th meeting. Okay, so we would hear from her um, if we had to act quickly, because I'm very uncomfortable acting without getting some kind of, of reasonable input from the Board of Health, since this is a health matter as well. So um, it sounds like we will get something. Thank you. Okay. Are there other questions or comments from the council? Okay. Then um, I see that we have the superintendent of schools and we have Dr. Morris and also uh, the finance director, Dr. Slaughter with us. And so we're going to go on to our action items. We begin with the re regional school budget. And because this is an issue that has picked up some controversy uh, in the last couple of months, uh, we're gonna begin with a couple of items that myself and then uh, this chair, the um, finance committee are going to just review for you the process. Um, as with any decision of the council, there's a significant amount of lead time and work that goes into taking a vote. Each year, we begin the budget process with the financial indicators meeting. That meeting took place on November 20th, 2020, and included the town council, the school committee, and the Jones Library trustees. That was followed on November 19th with the required public forum, where we really encourage residents to talk about their priorities for the coming year's budget. In December, of 2020, the town council adopted budget guidelines and shared those with the town manager, the town council in a full discussion. They were developed by the finance committee. And regarding this year's budget, we started by agreeing that all departments, including the schools, both regional and elementary schools would develop budgets that included no increase. In February, 2021, based upon updated financial information, that all departments were told to develop budgets with a 1.5% increase. And in March, 2021, that was increased to a 2.1% increase. In other words, all departments, including the schools have received an increase in their budgets for the coming year. The adoption of the regional school budget is outlined in the charter, sections 5.4, 5.5, and there might be other. Time-wise, it is always out of step, now that we have become the town otherwise, the city otherwise known as the town of Amherst. 
Um, and the reason it's out of step is because it's a regional budget and includes four municipalities. The other three municipalities have town meetings that happen before we have to adopt our budget. And because elected representatives of all those four municipalities also meet, they did twice this year, once in December on the 5th and once in February on the 6th. Um, the adoption of the regional school budget is a complicated and collaborative process. And I'm now going to turn to Andy Steinberg to talk about that. Okay, thank you, Linda. I, this is a complicated topic. And if there are questions from the council, uh, we have a lot of people who are present on the call who can help me to answer those questions. But basically, um, for the members of, who are attendees, uh, I think most of the council realize this, but I'm not sure everybody in the community always recognizes that the regional school district is a separate entity with a separate process and set of laws on how budgets are adopted. So our elementary school budget, which is part of town government, and we have an elected school committee, um, has a proposed budget that is um, was available today through the um, routine budget process, which um, considers all other aspects of the town budget. But the regional budget is really a unique um, process because it is a separate corporate entity and uh, it is made up of multiple towns in this, in our case, four towns. There's advantages to having a uh, regional district. Um, it gives size to the middle school and high school, which gives the ability to offer full, uh, a wider range of options, both academic and extracurricular, but it really does pose a challenge for the member towns um, and the regional district to um, adopt the budget. The budget has to uh, not only uh, come up with an amount, but it has to have a methodology that allocates portions of it to each of the member towns. Um, and uh, we have the process that uh, the president uh, of the council just described that um, is really an effort to try and um, adequately fund the schools, but also recognize the unique budget pressures for every member town. And uh, therefore, uh, we go through a much more complicated process in some ways than we do for other kinds of uh, aspects of the budget. Um, the uh, Four town meetings are an opportunity for the superintendent and the regional school committee to explain their needs and for, um, as noted, the towns to talk about their unique challenges, which can be financial and can be political. These meetings historically included uh, select boards, finance committees, and school committees of each member town. Now the council has uh, kind of replaced uh, the um, town's, um, our representation. Uh, the finance committee is aware that there's a lot of concern about the budget. There's some members of the council who've expressed concern about the growth in the budget and the, the fact that we have amongst the very highest cost per student of any uh, uh, of the towns in Western Massachusetts. Um, and um, that includes the regional budget having a very high cost per student. There are people who are concerned that um, there may be programs that are being lost. And uh, we're trying, to, we tried as a finance committee to understand both. One of the things that I want to clarify is that this $1.2 million of budget cuts has been talked about, but is sometimes a little bit misunderstood because when the uh, region develops its budget, what it's doing is developing a level services budget initially as a first step and looking at revenues and seeing what the difference is between the two. The gap between those two is $1.2 million. 
a portion of the gap was closed with adjustments in one-time funds, um, like the savings from the employee health insurance plan, the proposed actual programmatic reductions are much smaller portion. Um, but as noted, this is a regional process and the regional budget is proposed to increase by 0.72% uh, through assessment, though assessments to, uh, excuse me, to decrease, yes, I said decrease by 0.72%, but the assessments to the four towns combined actually increased by 1.52% and Amherst share um, is increasing by 2.1%. So that um, we actually right now are putting a higher level of increase than, um, so, than some of the other towns, which are actually having a decrease. And that's because of the um, assessment methodology. Um, two, two of the towns have a decrease in the budget the major reason for the budget decrease, in fact, is because of um, non-assessment revenues that are decreasing by around $500,000. So um, going on to the process going forward, the budget has to be passed by three member towns. If one town doesn't pass the budget, it's still binding on all other towns. The only town that's already acted is Leverett because they had their town meeting last Saturday. They approved the budget and the assessment method. Pelham and Shrewsbury have town meetings in coming weeks. The assessment method must be passed by all towns. And uh, uh, if the budget fails to pass in three towns so the assessment method fails to pass, the regional school committee can amend the budget and send it back to member towns. Uh, there is a time limit to their doing that action. And um, then ultimately, uh, at that point, the Commissioner of Education can impose a temporary budget, 112th budget, until uh, to give the towns and the region uh, a longer opportunity. Eventually, if it is not passed um, and there's still no budget passed, it's a, it, there's a date at which the commissioner of education can actually take fiscal control over the district. So in conclusion of my opening remarks, Amherst cannot vote to increase the budget that has now been submitted to member towns. Uh, and one other thing to note is that this year, the region has federal funds um, from previous COVID relief bills known as um, ESSER or Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund and money from the American Recovery Act. Um, when we asked about that at the Finance Committee meeting, Dr. Morris indicated that there had not been time to talk about how American Recovery Act might be used but that that is uh, funds that are available to add to the budget that's been proposed before us. So uh, that's basically the overview of the process that I was going to offer. So Andy, do you have um, any particular comment you want to make with regard to the Finance Committee's review and discussion? That report is in your packet. Yeah. Um, no, I, was, I think that the, fin the Finance Committee discussion was really focused uh, um, pretty much on what I already said. I think that there are a couple of things. One is, is that there are questions that were raised by various members of the committee and the council uh, members who um, participated in that particular meeting. And um, as far as the regional budget is concerned, we felt that the process has really gone on to a date that what we really were going to recommend to our three adjoining towns is that we have a uh, opportunity over the summer to really look at some of these budget questions that were raised and have a dialogue about them with the schools. Um, and uh, Dr. Morris indicated that who um, would uh, be happy to participate in that kind of a process. Um, so I was going to reach out to our neighboring towns and see if they are interested in joining us. Um, 
the uh, so that's kind of the uh, the forward looking part for the uh, the budget as far as this year's budget. I think that in the end, we concluded that uh, the school committee very carefully worked with the uh, superintendent to develop the budget that um, they felt that it made sense. We recognized that the American Recovery Act funds are available to address some of the issues that have been raised by members of the Finance Committee, and that uh, it was important that um, we engage in our process so that we can get the budget approved along with the other towns because of the complicated nature of what happens if uh, two towns reject the budget. We don't even know if that would ever, if, if, two, if there's any other town that would be interested. And uh, we felt that it's a, it's a uh, reasonable, well thought out budget and we would recommend that it be passed tonight. Okay. Uh, I just want to ask uh, Superintendent Morris whether you have any additional comments you'd like to make at this time. Thank you for the opportunity. I think at this point, you know, given the hearing with the Finance Committee and the other with the Town Council uh, prior, I don't think I have anything more I'd like to add. Give doc if it's okay with you, give Dr. Slaughter if he has an opportunity, if he has anything else to add, but otherwise we're just here if there's questions. Thank you, Dr. Slaughter. Uh, no, I don't have any other comments to add at this time. All right. Um, and um, we're going to have a council discussion, an opportunity for public comment, come back for any further council discussion and then a vote. And I might add that there are several votes that go with this particular item. Dorothy, you have your hand up. Um, I'd like to ask um, um, Superintendent Morris if Amherst school system will be able to offer some kind of enriched summer program using some of the federal monies. Um, yep, just to clarify, and I think it, I don't want to harp on this, but um, since this is just about the regional schools, I, I'm assuming that your question was not about the Amherst public schools, but the Amherst Pelham Regional School District or right. secondary schools. I just wanted to make sure because that's a common point of confusion. Um, we already have uh, at the high school put out uh, information about our summer programming uh, options. Uh, and at the middle school, that'll be coming soon. So we are having summer programming options for both uh, for seven through 12 and Summit Academy uh, because of the nature of a day school always has a summer program. And there was actually a meeting about that today. Um, so we are moving forward with uh, more summer program about uh, in the neighborhood at the high school, about a third more offerings than would typically have. Thank you. Thank you very much. No problem. Uh, Alyssa. I don't have a comment on the budget at this time because thank you, we did have a good hearing about that before, but I just wanted to mention in terms of kind of a point of order is that when we get to this public comment period, I understand this is a separate public comment period than when we had before, but I know it came up in our original public comment period tonight and it's come up at recent meetings. Under our rules, we only have one person per public comment, one comment per person under our rules 5.1. and so that's up to you to manage what happened at the earlier public comment period but just during this one if people i just don't want people to be upset to feel like they should get to talk more than once because our rules say they talk once and obviously we could we've talked about the idea of having work sessions under rule 3.9 but we don't have that yet so given that i'm hoping that people will not be offended when we restrict them to one public comment during this comment period thank you Alyssa, and i appreciate that that reminder uh, to me and the public. Um, are there any other questions from the council at this time? Darcy? You have to unmute, Darcy. Darcy, you need to unmute. Uh, just, I just have a question about the process here. Um, uh, as far as council discussion, uh, I see we have four different motions coming up. Yes. Um, and so are we going to have separate discussion after each one or how is that gonna work? Um, yes, the, the motion will be made, seconded, and then there'll be questions. Okay, for each of the four motions. Yes, but if you have a general question at this point, please ask. Yeah, I do have one general question and that is that if, 
if we fund a, uh, a less than level services budget, um, does that then become the baseline for the, uh, the next fiscal year budget? Yes, it does. So we don't make that up. You know, we don't assume we're going to make it up later. That's not been the past practice um, that I've experienced. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thanks. I'm working on my answers being succinct, so I hope that was okay. <laughs> Gotten we, feedback, we, and I'm working on it. So <laughs> we appreciate that, uh, Shalini. Uh, I apologize, I wasn't um, attending any of the earlier discussions. If this has already been answered, but I'm struggling with how to respond to kids and teachers who are, and if you could, uh, who are especially in coming out of a pandemic, when we're looking at core academic FTE reductions, reductions in para, reduction in art. And given that we have funding coming from um, the state, so, and some of this is due to declining enrollment, and is that enrollment decline pertaining to this one year or was it so just like how do we like what is that information gap because i know you all have been so thoughtful and you've struggled with this and you've come to this conclusion so how can we what is the information gap that might help us all understand better sure so uh, and i'm struggling with it too so i'm right there with you um mm -hmm. So I think a couple of things. Uh, I think the first thing, the enrollment drop is very real. So we're anticipating unrelated to COVID and assuming mm -hmm. that people come back, we're assuming uh, not much over 800 students at our high school next year. That's a high school that for quite a while has been in the neighborhood of a thousand students. And this is a demographic shift. It's already been through our elementary schools. So if you look at our elementary schools, these same cohorts, it's not like, oh, people are fleeing. Our charter numbers have been very consistent. Uh, for the last couple of years, they were going up, up, and then they flattened. Um, but if you look at the cohorts, our cohort, when these incoming ninth graders were incoming kindergartners, it was a smaller group. And we've seen that shift over time. So that enrollment drop is very real. Um, I think the part that get where it gets tricky is that we're not making widgets. So it's not easy to make reductions based mm -hmm. on uh, in the overall context of the of the district, a relatively minor drop, you know, I think it's been going on a couple of years, and we've been trying to sort of meet it. And it's it's a little bit of a you know a dance of you know what how do you reduce given lower enrollment? You know, is it elective? Is it reducing core academic subjects because there's not the need? And and for us, especially at the high school level, it's really the students demand courses on the course, right? So we don't create the courses and just say students re-register. We look at the past courses that students take and then make decisions about what to offer as best we can. But that gets really hard. And I wanna really honor and recognize the comments from staff and from students. Um, there is a real, real loss uh, of electives and opportunities when we make these reductions, even if it's accounting for very real reductions in number of students. If I'm an individual student, I still have less options than I had five years ago, right? And some of that's related to budget and some of that's related to enrollment, but none of it feels very good. None of it's satisfying. And um, I struggle in the same way, again, that, that you raised that point, so I appreciate you raising it. In terms of the stimulus funds, you know, I know uh, I talk with, you know, Doug and I talk with Paul and with Sean uh, frequently. And as things become more clear on the use of those funds, we'll be having active conversations about whether uh, they might be able to be used to assist um, in this regard. But at this point, I don't have, at least on the school side, uh, the stimulus funds, um, we have three different estimates we've gotten from three different uh, legislators, state, federal, and then uh, another one from the state. None of them match. We have not gotten clear description of uh, intended uses. Um, we heard it's for three years, and I heard the commissioner last week saying, no, maybe it'll be for four years. So there's a real lack of certainty right now. Uh, on those funds, the, the funds we've already uh, received from the ESSER, what's called ESSER, uh, a lot of those are related to, we still have ventilation we have to fix. We still have other things that we need to do to, as we continue to use uh, more and more of our spaces. And so 
Uh, some of that is going to be earmarked specifically for COVID related. In terms of the newer uh, stimulus funds, uh, right now we don't have full clarity. And when we do, you know, I know Paul and Sean have have shared that they're very open to having conversations with us about seeing how uh, things develop over time. Sorry, I didn't do well in the succinct part of that one. My apologies. Uh, no, I mm -hmm. Mike, you did actually quite well. And I, I really want to mm -hmm. appreciate that. Having taught in a high school of 400, believe me, Amherst is, looks like a great school district to me. Um, one of two math teachers for 400 kids. Uh, so are there any other council questions? Then I'm going to ask if there's any questions from the audience. Please raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, then I'm going to begin the process. And these are all orders, financial orders that were reviewed by the Finance Committee and recommended to the Council. The first one is uh, I move in accordance with Section 5.5C of the Amherst Home Rule Char Charter and in compliance with Section 5.5A and 5.5B of the Amherst Home Rule Charter to separately consider and act on the Amherst Pelham Regional School District budgets and assessment method for fiscal year 2022 due to the agreement with the three other towns in the Regional School District. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. Thank you, Pat. Any further discussion or questions? Okay, seeing none, we're going to begin with Alyssa. Hi. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Darcy? Yes. Grace Merzen, aye. Mandy Jow? Aye. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Evan? Aye. George? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Steve Schreiber? Aye. Andy? Aye. Sarah? Aye. And Shalini? Yes. It's a unanimous 13 0, 0 and no absences. The next one, in accordance with Charter Section 5.5, having, having been referred to the Finance Committee, a public hearing held on April 5th, 2021, having been recommended by the Finance Committee, Committee Report of May 3rd, 2021, a public hearing held on April 5th, 2021, notice which was posted for a minimum of 10 days on March 25th, 2021, to adopt Council Order 2020-01, an order approving the Amherst Pelham Regional School District Assessment Method for FY 2022 as presented. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, I'm going to start with um, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Darcy. Yes. Reese Marisa, yes. Haneke. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan. Aye. George. Yes. Kathy. Yes. Steve. Aye. Andy. Aye. Sarah. Aye. Alyssa. Shalini. Aye. I'm sorry, I skipped Shalini. Shalini? Yes. And then Alyssa, thank you. That's also unanimous, 13-0-0 and none absent. The next one, in accordance with Charter Section 5.5, having been referred to the Finance Committee, a public hearing held on April 5th, 2021, having been recommended by the Finance Committee report on May 3rd, May 3, 2021, a public hearing held on April 5, 2021, notice of which was posted for a minimum of 10 days on March 25, 2021, to adopt Council Order 2020-02, an order approving the Amherst Regional School District FY22 
budget and appropriating the town of Amherst share of the budget. Assessment, and, sorry, went to the next page. Is there a second? Yes, second. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Yes, Darcy. That's the motion about the assessment method or about the budget? This is the motion about us appropriating our share to meet the budget, yes. It is also about the budget. Yes, yeah. so I have a comment. It's of the budget. Okay. Um, Darcy. Yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement with the, the students and the speakers who commented um, about the school budget and how important it is to maintain at least level services from year to year. And um, I, I feel pretty strongly that we should have been able to figure out a way to do that either by not taking so much from our capital budget or from moving from other departments. Um, uh, I guess I feel like once we take away something like dance or other electives, it's really hard to bring them back. Um, and dance is exactly the type of class that motivates students to come to school and stay in school. And an adjustment counselor, same type of thing. So um, as the students in the Sunrise group requested, I, I really think we should be prioritizing education and restoring the school district budget by, um, by reallocating at least the funds equating to a certain number of APD positions toward the arts, middle school teaching, um, P health and bilingual psychology. Um, and I know that there are, are um, actually more than those two positions that we are, uh, we have seen already being used um, in the budget. So I've heard that there are up to five potential APD positions. So, are you planning to make this as a motion? Uh, no, I am not. Okay, Dorothy. Well, I am gonna vote for the budget because I know that we have to for the process to go forward with the other towns. But I am taking a bet that somehow we will be able to do what Darcy suggests is to make the budget whole when we find a way to use additional funds. Um, and that I'm hoping that all efforts will be made to do that. Because I do agree that the things that have students come to school are often things that get cut. But I know that we have to vote this tonight if or the process is not gonna go forward properly. So um, I'm balancing hope and expectations. Thank you. Andy. Yeah, I just wanna, um, in response, remind uh, everyone what I had reported on earlier, because since it is a four town process, um, we don't own the budget the way we own the budget of our elementary schools and our ability to increase the budget is uh, not one that we can make as a single town. It is, it really has, even if we wanted to do that and there's a lot of financial reasons, we'd have to consider the four town process makes it a very difficult process to engage in. Um, Kathy. Um, I, I also, I'm, I'm not speaking against going forward with this, but one of the um, dilemmas I find myself in is that we get a budget after it's gone through the school committee. So aside from the four, four town side of it, if um, I were to look at declining enrollment and then what the allocations are, I would look to have we, um, is the what's the administrative non-classroom staff look like? What do those line items look like over time? I would do more assessment. And I know, um, Doug and Mike, that you've been doing that, but I would be really hard-nosed about it to see, you know, to protect classroom hours by looking to other parts of the budget. So that's the broader discussion that was 
uh, just beginning to be touched on on Andy because we are spending more, a lot more per student um, than surrounding towns are. So I'd also want to look at the, you know, what's happening with the mix of spec spending on regular classroom hours and special needs hours, but it's, it's more an overall look at the budget to say, can we um, get more classroom hours and more, more pieces out of what we are spending? Because I don't think we're underspending per student in our school system. Um, my question more is how are there better ways to allocate it? And I absolutely agree with the statements on art, music, dance, anything that gets the kids involved. Um, because aside from what those are, I've, I've been seeing these incredibly creative programs that teach STEM by dance, you know, bring kids in in ways that they um, wouldn't normally, the kids who dance are learning math and science, the kids who like math and science are learning how to dance. It, it's uh, an enrichment program. And I would like to think that we can be creative in our budget and get more for a similar amount of dollars. So I am strongly in favor on how do we um, look closely at these budgets as we go forward in, in the years to come um, as if enrollment is down, I'm looking at when my kids were there, how many top level staff who weren't in the classroom did we have? And now how many do we have 20 years later and asking have we have, have have we adjusted as much as we can? And those are questions I would love to have answered. Uh, Dr. Morris, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll be brief. So one is that there is no reduction to the dance program. So I just want to be really clear because I've heard that mentioned a couple of times. Um, the second thing I'd like to say is we've cut about 20% of our staff at central office. And honestly, you know, we've frustrated the heck out of certain counselors because we don't produce the level of documentation that some of you would want. And so I think, you know, just bluntly and succinctly as I'm trying, um, I think, you know, we've made much a much higher percentage reduction of non-classroom staff as we cut year after year after year. And at some point uh, we are running the risk of under, so, uh, not being able to support what the community demands in terms of data and information. So I think that's really the tension point. And I think uh, you know, the mental note I'm taking on the conversation tonight is when we get to four town meetings next year uh, to have a more active conversation because the idea of those being before, especially the December one, before the school committee actually sees and interacts with the budget is that the four towns give the feedback on their comfort level of what's being proposed. And so I think uh, good feedback for me is to be a little more forceful of pushing uh, the towns to say, where are you on this? You know, I think it's a delicate dance and maybe I'm dancing a little too much on the delicate side and a little less on the blunt side of saying, you know, what schools do you want, right? Because that's essentially what it comes down to. So I'll own that part and, and I'll take that with me and may annoy a lot of people next four town meeting next December by being that blunt, but I think it's really useful feedback and we we'll certainly can act on that next year. Thank you. The motion on the table is the one that is to adopt council order FY 2020-02 and order approving Amherst Pelham Regional School District FY 2022 budget and appropriating the town of Amherst share of the budget assessment as presented. Seeing no other questions, I'm gonna to move to a vote. Darcy? No. Lynn Griesmer is a yes. Mandy Jo Haneke. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Aye. Uh, George Ryan. Yes. Jane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Aye. Valerie Balmill. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Aye. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. The vote is 12 in favor, one opposed, no abstentions and no absence. The last motion that is related to this item is the following. In, in accordance with Charter Section 5.5, having, having been referred to the Finance Committee, a public hearing held on April 5th, 2021, having been recommended by the Finance Committee report on May 3rd, 2021, 
a public hearing held on April 5th, 2021, notice of which was posted for a minimum of 10 days on March 25th, 2021, to adopt Council Order FY2020, 2022, FY22-03, an order approving the Amherst Regional and Amherst Pelham Regional School District debt authorization for FY 2022 as presented. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion or questions? I'm seeing none. I'm going to begin the vote with myself. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Jo? Aye. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Evan Ross? Aye. George? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Steve? Aye. Andy? Aye. Sarah? Aye. Shalini? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Alyssa? Aye. Pat? Aye. And Darcy? Yes. That vote is unanimous, 13 0, 0 and no absences. I want to thank the superintendent and the finance director from the schools for joining us, especially this evening. And we are going to take a five minute break and be back for the budget. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Please good night. mute. Yes, thank you. Mute and also put your video. Melissa and Darcy and George, are you back? Yes. Thank you. Sarah, are you back? I'm waiting for George and Sarah to put their cameras on. George and Sarah, are you back? Please put your cameras on. Okay, George. Sarah, are you back? Okay, um, I'm just going to briefly introduce this next, which is one of the main shows of the evening. Um, it's really picking up on the budget process that we just discussed. Uh, only in this case, it is the Town of Amherst operating budget and capital improvement program that the town manager and his staff will be talking about. Um, we've already voted to refer this to the finance committee. 
And I want to make note that there will be a hearing on the operating budget on May 17th and on the capital improvement program on June 7th. And somewhere in the month of June, it is hoped that after the finance committee has thoroughly explored the budget that the town council will vote the budget. Uh, I want to particularly thank the town manager, the finance director, the controller, and uh, the many, many other staff who have worked hard and long hours to bring us this budget. It's been driven by many factors, including the town council's budget policy guidelines and the town council's performance goals for the town manager for July 1st to June 30th, 2021, which have been amended at least twice. In addition, the Finance Committee will provide a brief update on the review of the Town Council's budget at our meetings on May 17th and 24th. So when we get to June, it won't be the first time you've heard about any deliberations. With that, I'm going to turn the uh, podium over to uh, the Town Manager and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Lynn. So it, we're here. We're this is we put a lot of work into this process. So we're really excited to um, be here and, and thank you for the time that you're giving us. And I'm really proud of this FY 2022 budget. Um, it's balanced. It aligns with the allocation of funds it, it, with the goals that you've established by the town council. It identifies some of the challenges we have faced during the pandemic and what the town did to meet them. We emerged from this pandemic full of hope and optimism. We've built a strong foundation based on good planning, um, strong leadership and prudent financial decisions. Even so, there are many unknowns before us. Nevertheless, we are one community with, with, with mutual interest. Our in institutional partners are reinvesting in our community and our economy has proven its resiliency. The budget before you, all 279 pages of it, has extensive information to provide the information you need to make wise decisions on, on behalf of the townspeople. So just as context, we this is a once in a century pandemic that none of us have ever experienced, um, both in municipal life or any other life. And we it, the pandemic hit Amherst particularly hard because the three institutions of higher education, our three largest employers, pretty much shut down very quickly and sapped the economic energy out of our community. This created a budget crisis, which we all lived through last year, and we appreciate the work and the flexibility that you had and that the state government gave us to uh, have a one-month budget and then a year-long budget. Our focus, and you've heard me say this a million times, is continuity of operations and being able to adjust to new challenges. And I think, and I've said this before also, our strong creative leadership team was core and we continue to, we call it a COVID response uh, team, core team. Uh, we continue to meet on a regular basis, at least weekly to review anything that's coming up around COVID-19. Um, and the last thing I wanna mention is, is just how proud I am of our staff. We've, one of my missions on this, in this, in this uh, process was to try to avoid layoffs or furloughs because I believed that um, as a town employer, a local employer, maintaining people's jobs was a high, it was a very high priority. And because if you get laid off and you lose funds, it disrupts your family and it has um, a ripple effect. And to do that, we had to ask our employees to do th different things. And every time I asked staff to do something different, they asked, tell me what you need. Never did I hear anyone say, that's not in my job description. So really proud of all the staff who've stepped up and taken that on. So next slide. So this is usually, this is a slide that usually comes at the end, um, but I want to state right here and now and up front, uh, thank you to our town staff, to our partners in higher education and the business and nonprofit communities and all the community members who have battled through the pandemic and continue to contribute to the well-being of the town and our elected leaders. You, you guys have muscled through this entire time. Uh, and so it's, I think the community needs to recognize the work that you've put into it. Next slide. So as I mentioned, this is how we are starting our budget. This is, it's a budget built on hope and optimism and sets the foundation for our reemergence re from the COVID um, downslide that, that we are coming out of. Next slide. 
So as we built this budget, we are we're fortunate to be in a very strong financial position. Our reserves are strong, 21.5% of our budget, and we have a, a strong AA plus bond rating. We're hoping to have that improve, but we're no, we're given the sort of general um, status of the economy, we're not sure we'll be able to achieve that. Uh, we maintain our core services, 2.1% increase for funds to, uh, through all the, for all the different budgets to fund our operations, which means few new initiatives. And then we have this, the new thing that we've talked about, which is federal CARES funds, the new ARPA money, which no one knows what, is, what it means, and the ESSER funds that the schools are getting. And the exciting thing about this budget, I think, and where we are as a town, is that we have a funding plan uh, to, thanks to Mr. Mangano, to fund our four capital projects with one, just one debt exclusion. And we have developed five-year operating and capital plans and have, are developing the basis for inventorying all of our capital needs. That will make us even stronger as we move forward. Next slide. So, as, so just so people know that the town's budget has five components. The municipal budget, which is uh, we're gonna talk about tonight, which includes the four enterprise funds, the elementary school budget, uh, the library budget, the Amherst Pelham Regional School District, which you just voted, and then the capital improvement program. There's also two pieces, if you wanna see the, to, uh, the, the town's budget in total, you, you should also look at the Community Preservation Act budget and this Community Development Block Grant budget. So that is everything in terms of a nutshell. And we tried to assemble this all together on one location on our website. Thank you. Um, so big highlights. Um, proposed budget, $85,566,836. Sets the, sets the foundation for recovery, which is where we are we're starting to feel it already. It aligns the budgets directly with the goals adopted by the town council. And you will see that throughout our presentation and throughout the budget document. It, we have been able to afford modest operating budget increases of 2.1%, which went to the regional school district, to our elementary schools, to the town and to the library. And we begin to restore our capital spending, moving up to 8.5% of the levy last year we use the capital expenditure to help balance the budget it was down to 5%. So again, moving that to where we think it needs to be in order to move, to move our whole operation forward. So overall, when you take into the fixed costs that get factored in, our budget increases 5.7%, but that's from a reduced base from last year. So, it, it, so that's a, it's a good increase, um, but we're still not where we, where we were prior. Um, I mentioned the new federal funds are coming forward. And then the other thing I really wanna mention is that we have a new budget format and an interactive story map to make the budget more engaging and it's gonna look different. And it took a lot more work and effort than it ever did before because of all the format changes. And at 625, Sean was still working on things like why isn't this not showing up my computer, right? Um, so uh, it was an exciting uh, last couple of weeks, but we were here tonight, so thank you. So one of the big pieces of this is our capital improvement program, which we're going to talk a little bit more about. Again, talked about that restoring the budget incorp incorporates the capital requirements of three of the four building projects in the existing budget. Um, because And we don't know the price of the, um, the um, schools yet at this point. So that's, that's not addressed. Addresses deferred maintenance of existing infrastructure. Maintains, and this has been a high priority since I've been here, our investment in roads and sidewalks. And we, we, you'll notice in the capital improvement program that we've looked through, looked at all of our projects through the lens of the impact that they have on climate change and which ones are, are helping with that by a little green leaf on it. Next slide. So this is the, the new thing that we're presenting tonight, the budget story map. So we're gonna go into a different format and I'll tell you why we're doing this. Um, so something new. Um, so you have the 279 pages that you can study at your heart's content, but, but that's not very accessible to the general public. They're not gonna sit down and read it. Some people will, we have some people who live in town who will get into that, which is great. Um, but we also want it to be accessible to other people. And this story map is easier to read than a PowerPoint. It's designed to be mobile friendly because a lot of people are accessing information on their, their pads or their, um, their, lap, their, um, their phones. 
and make it more easily accessible to people in a more friendly way. So we're, Sean and I are going to tag team on this, uh, this presentation. But before we start, I do want to thank everyone who built the budget. Sean is the finance director. He's guided the work, but the nuts and bolts and the crunching of the numbers was done by our esteemed comptroller, Sonia Aldridge, and assistant comptroller, Holly Bowser, who are both, Bowser, who are both here tonight. Um, they worked hours on this, met and met, and then met again with all of our department heads to get them in line. Um, and then lastly, the whole concept of how to present this information, how to redesign the budget, which I, when you, you look at it in its totality, I think you're going to really like the the view it's much more visually pleasing was the work of Sean with communications manager uh, Brianna Sunred. So, so this is our um, sort of quote of the day where we're going to reemerge a stronger, safer, more resilient community with new initiatives that will invest significantly in our collective future. Um, these are things that are the new initiatives are not fully funded, which we will address a little in a little bit, but they show a direction where we think that we can go. So next. So you can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So um, Paul, before I go on to the budget overview, do you mind if I give a quick orientation of um, how this thing works? Perfect. Um, so as Paul mentioned before we um, started working, I had to make sure it looked okay on my screen because I have really wide monitors that are designed more for spreadsheets, but not so much for this. So I'm actually on a laptop right now and it, hopefully it looks okay to you all on the screen and um, the size good. is good. Um, but the way this works is you can essentially scroll through it or you can click over to these different um, content areas at the top. And so the content areas are sort of a welcome message. There's a budget overview, which provides sort of the baseline knowledge that you need um, to understand the, the highlights of the budget. Um, some of what we've already gone over in the PowerPoint. Um, this year, we specifically added a section on COVID response because we know there's been a lot of questions about what, what, is, what has been done in response to COVID. And so we highlighted some of those things, but there's also a much more robust section on what we did um, for COVID in the budget book. And then the next six are all goals of the council um, for the town manager. So when we go through those, you'll, you'll see the goal for the council and then some of the highlights of what this budget, um, either new funds or existing funds um, are, are doing related to that goal. And then we wrap it up with sort of how to get involved section. And also there's lots of hyperlinks as well for people to click on. Yep, so this section budget overview as Paul mentioned hyperlink right there. So anyone viewing this can click to the whole budget document if they just click that line right there. Uh, proposed overall FY22 budget, 85,566,836. Uh, Paul already mentioned about 2.1% increases for all um, operating uh, budgets. Again, that started at 0% as more information came in, it was increased to 1.5%. And then if more information came in again, we increased it to 2.1% um, to try to capture the latest information we could. Capital spending has increased about 2.6 million. Um, again, this is from a, a significantly reduced FY21 figure. So that's about 8.5% of the levy for capital. And it also includes a rollover of the FY21 capital reserve. Um, for those of you who remember last year, we didn't specifically allocate some of the money for projects because we wanted it to be a reserve there in case there was an emergency. Fortunately, no emergencies have occurred this year. And so this proposal appropriates that to support specific pro uh, a specific project um, in the capital improvement program for FY22. Uh, we continue to fund pension and OPEB commitments. So we one area we reduced in FY21 was our OPEB contribution. It went from 500,000 down to 250. This proposal increases at 50,000 back up to 300,000. Uh, and we've recently received the actuarial analysis and it is important that we keep trying to stick to our funding plan for OPEB. It, it does impact our bond rating and things of that nature. Um, and it affects our overall liability that we have on our books. It does, this proposal includes a small commitment of funds from the American Rescue Plan. We're still learning more information about that grant, but we do have sort of the key areas that it can fund. And so we've uh, put out some ideas of the specific things that we think are good ideas that are aligned with the goals. Um, and then also there will be a process for allocating the, the much larger portion of that grant. And Paul already mentioned about the new budget format and this interactive companion piece. And again, the overall budget increases 5.7%. Uh, 
So the way you work through this is you just keep scrolling down and it kind of scrolls with you. So I won't spend a lot of time here, but here are the tables that you're used to seeing about the different departments and what their, their new allocation is for FY22. And here's capital, retirement, and then other, um, assess, which is state assessments and some other areas. And then our overall budget. So the next piece, so that was more on the expense side of our general fund budget. This next part is about the revenues. So property taxes, we're projecting the two and a half percent increase, allowable increase plus new growth. We've returned our new growth estimate to be more in line with where it's been in the past based on the projects that we know are in process right now. And there was some unused excess uh, levy capacity last year that's also been included. So the overall property tax increase is 4.1%. Uh, local receipts are, we're projecting a, a large increase because that was one of the areas that took the biggest hit in FY21. So the overall increase to local receipts is 23%. And that includes areas like excise taxes, hotel motel, rental revenue, departmental receipts, um, licenses, fees, penalties. Uh, for the first time, we did include a preliminary budget for the marijuana tax. That's not the impact money. It's just the excise tax portion of that. And so there is a uh, budget for that included as well. Uh, state aid, we are uh, estimated 2.6% increase. That's mostly uh, due to an increase in the unrestricted general government aid allocation. Chapter 70 was pretty much flat and there was a, a change in charter tuition reimbursement as well. And then the last major section of our revenues is other financing sources and we're projecting a 24% increase, sorry, it's cut off a little bit by the, the people on my screen. Um, and so the major areas there are ambulance receipts. We're projecting, a, I think about a 7% increase in ambulance receipts. That was an area that was cut down for FY21. Um, and as the university and college comes back, we anticipate that will recover a little bit. Uh, this area also includes that capital, FY21 capital reserve that I mentioned before, appropriating that for FY22 is here. And the other kind of noteworthy uh, account here is we are appropriating some of the cable money that we get that will fund the municipal fiber installation. The first year of, of that funding is appropriated here as well. So then we navigate to enterprise funds. So uh, water uh, expenses are projected to go up 9.4%. This, uh, the two major drivers here are um, increases in our debt obligation and increases in capital expenditures. So one of the strategies that we use for FY21 to respond to the pandemic was we reduced capital in the enterprise funds quite a bit as well. And so the FY22 proposal here in water restores some of that capital spending. On the sewer side, it's a 7.6% increase, and this is mostly some increases on the operating side, operating expense side, and also this also has some new debt obligations that will increase the, the payments for FY22. Transportation is a decrease of 17.1%, where this is one of the, uh, really these top three enterprise funds are the ones that we're worried about their revenues for next year because they were hit pretty hard by the pandemic. Um, Transportation, we're projecting sort of a very slow recovery until we see things bounce back to, to where they used to be. Um, and so this has been reduced. And so one of the ways that we, one of the items that we reduce in these budgets um, when revenues don't come in as much as we expect are the indirect costs that they pay to the general fund. And so when they're not bringing in all the revenues that they're supposed to, that does impact the general fund pretty directly. And so this is an area that we expect to recover, which will help the enterprise funds, but will also help the general fund in the future. And then the last one here is solid waste. We're projecting a 4.2% decrease. There was a sort of a temporary bump up in FY21 because there, we had a, um, a matching portion of a grant for the roll-off truck that we had sort of a one-time expense. And now that that grant has gone through and we have the roll-off truck, which you see here on the, the left side of your screen, um, we can take that matching expense out. Just some other notes on enterprise funds. So, uh, we do continue to project reduced water and sewer consumption, and that has a direct impact on the revenues. As long as our consumption is sort of below normal levels, that translates to our revenues below normal levels and puts more stress on the enterprise fund. So we're projecting a little bit lower for FY22, and as we monitor things, um, we anticipate that it'll start to recover in the, the years after that. 
Uh, we, the, we've talked about water and sewer rates a little bit, but the, the proposed rates for FY22 are still below um, state average in a lot of our uh, surrounding communities. Uh, gradual upturn in uh, business activity downtown. We're hoping we'll produce a, a modest increase in parking revenue, um, but we will see it hopefully when the college and universities return. And we are proposing to use um, a modest amount of moderate amount of reserves in the sewer and solid waste fund for FY22. Um, this is another area that we'll come back to when we do eventually talk in more detail about the American Rescue Plan Act funds. Um, one of the explicit purposes for those funds is revenue replacement and some of the areas where we've seen the biggest impact on revenues are in our enterprise funds. And then to the last key section here is our capital improvement program. So as the town manager said, continued commitment to repaving roads and sidewalks. Uh, this proposal has 850,000 for roads in addition to the chapter 90 money that is also goes towards roads. Uh, 200,000 for sidewalks. And then we also noted that we have a couple of grants that um, will have some benefits for sidewalks as well, which is the, the multi-use path to Groff Park and some ADA improvements near the senior center. For the first time, um, I think the first time uh, we added a, a recurring item for sustainability projects. Uh, for FY22, it's 100,000. Um, this is meant to fund things like upgrading vehicles to hybrid or fully electric, um, to do studies. Uh, that we had a request during the um, Joint Capital Planning Committee to do a solar study. This money could fund something like that. Um, that specific project we're, we're pursuing grants for, but if the grants don't come through, it could fund a project such as that. Um, it can be serve as, as a match to leverage state grants as well. Uh, in that capital pro proven program, we also have 100,000 for uh, support services to update zoning bylaws. Uh, this specific 100,000 is a combination of about, um, I think it's $60,000 in new money and $40,000 has been repurposed from an old article uh, to come up with a total of 100,000. We also, for the first time, are putting in what we intend to be a recurring item for accessibility improvements. Uh, we had the ADA uh, study that listed a whole bunch of areas where we could make improvements. And so this, uh, and this specific uh, proposal, the capital improvement program includes 50,000, and that could fluctuate because we have other facility improvement um, money that could also be put towards accessibility improvements as well. Um, but we intend for that to be a recurring item. And then sort of a big, piece that we added is uh, design and project management services for the fire station and for the public works. So really the next section or the next um, stage that we need to move to to further those projects is to start doing some design work. Um, and before we can do design work, uh, because of the amount of those projects, we're required to have a project uh, owner's project manager. And so you'll see a borrowing, authori borrowing authorization in the capital improvement program um, which is roughly in the ballpark of 70 to 80 percent of what we anticipate to be the design cost and the project management cost for those buildings. And there's a little pie chart over here that you can click on. I'll make it a little bigger. Um, we got some, I had some feedback earlier today that I couldn't fix, but I just wanted to clarify in case anybody has questions. This slice here, public works, administrative other, it looks like a very big slice. It's normally for things like the stormwater um, program or the transportation plan. It's a very big slice this year in particular because this is where the uh, borrowing authorization for the, um, the DPW building is. And this is where, and the fire slice is big because that's where the borrowing authorization for the fire station project is. So those, that borrowing authorization is part of this pie chart. And so those slices are bigger than they normally would be in a different year. And if anybody wants to, they can click to the full capital improvement program uh, by clicking on this button, but I won't do that now. And with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Paul to talk about the town's COVID response. So if there's a, um, thank you, Sean. So um, if there's a Time Magazine story of the year, obviously it's COVID and, and everything that we've done during the last year and everything we're looking to do has, is, is framed by the co by COVID. So we want to talk take a few minutes to look at what what is what we're doing about COVID. So at the beginning of the pandemic um, and through the entire 14 months we were on, we've been looking at this the 
we've been working to meet the needs of our most vulnerable people, the, the folks who are experiencing homelessness. Um, the first thing we did when COVID first hit, it was the most, it was a very high priority was to identify a location for isolation and quarantine space with support services. And we were fortunate that Hampshire College came through and dedicated an, an entire dormitory for our use and offered meal service and recognizing the population. They even established a designated smoking area on a virtually non-smoking campus. Um, the staff and volunteers at Craig's Doors were creative in securing millions of dollars in state funds to help relocate the seasonal shelter, secure the University Motor Lodge and the O'Connor Lodge in Hadley um, for individual residences and provide better, safer shelter for more people who were unhoused than the town has ever accommodated. The town supported these efforts and helped with permitting and uh, facilitating and uh, setting up a cooling shelter last summer um, so if there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, we, we understand the, um, the need for a new location because the Unitarian Universalist Church will be terminating their relationship at this point with Craig's doors because they wanna reopen their, their building. Uh, but the building inspector has given, the building commissioner has extended the occupancy of the, of the Unitarian Universalist Church through July 31. So next. So the front and center in our, in our COVID response has been our health department. Um, they um, didn't meet, miss a beat as we transitioned health directors and we were able to manage the cases that came before us and even clusters that have come through. Um, we've done the contact tracing that we've had to do. We've built a robust vaccination program that has vaccinated nearly 10,000 people so far. Um, and they has expanded to offer with the fire department vaccines to homebound members of the region. Um, to ensure the reliability of our staff, we added four firefighter paramedics temporarily to the fire department for most of the year and provided added staff support for the health department. And we created that COVID ambassadors program, which you know about. Um, so we'll keep moving. So one of the key areas that we've, uh, we, um, so we, this, I just talked about this. And we, and we, one of the last things we talked a little bit about redeploying people to current staffing needs like at uh, Puffer's Pond, at Cherry Hill, instead of hiring temporary employees, our current, our existing staff were able to fill those, those slots. A key piece of our efforts has been on communication. Um, and under the guidance of our communications manager, we were able to maintain multiple ways for the public to connect with our town government. We set up the COVID hotline that handled hundreds of calls and every one of them was answered in real time or returned if there was a message left. We set up a special COVID website to funnel all relevant local and state information into one location. We initiated weekly community chats uh, with the town manager and the communication manager and special guests um, where the, uh, members of the public could just join into the conversation. And we continued our monthly office hours and cup of joe with Paul. And in terms of digital services, you all experience it. We're experiencing it right. We're experiencing it right now. We hustled to get Zoom and Teams up and running. IT were miracle workers, really, at getting the technology and the systems in place to let us, including our key decision makers, to continue working and do the important work that they do. Uh, we just developed the Engage Amherst online uh, platform. Uh, and then also expanded our bill paying online permitting and licensing, online licensing um, for some of the work that we're doing right now. Paul, and I'll just add real quick, I'm sure you'll, you'll touch on it later. Uh, we have an Engage Amherst site set mm -hmm. up for the FY22 budget. Um, I'm not, for those who have seen the Pomeroy Village one or the, the four building project one, um, it's a really nice way to submit questions and get answers and kind of log, and then you can keep a kind of running list of those questions and answers, which has been really helpful. And so that is set up. And if you click uh, the Engage Amherst link here, or it's also in the budget document in a few places, it'll bring you to the FY22 page and uh, people can submit feedback and, and get questions answered. So one of the things that we had to maintain, we had to set up new protocols for how we ac access the buildings. You know, all of our buildings have been utilized by town staff um, on a regular basis. And our town facilities department has been spectacular about um, making sure everything is sanitary and uh, we have the right air, qu air quality systems in place. 
Um, and so we just want to thank them for that work that they've done. Okay. You know, business, business support was really crucial because that's the lifeblood of our downtown area. And those businesses uh, took a hammering. You know, we, we saw Hastings close for the first time in a hundred years. Um, that really was an indicator that things were different. We saw some restaurants close and, and won't reopen. Others ha have uh, staggered through the pandemic and, and will come back with uh, and excited to be returning. Uh, we re redesigned the downtown area um, so that, and purchased these um, you know, umbrellas and, and lighting and heating and uh, drove all over New York to try and get enough heat lamps because everything was in demand at the same time. Um, the town council passed special temporary zoning to allow all this to happen. Um, and then we th put through, uh, put picnic tables in other uh, locations at, in downtown uh, at Cushman and on the, on the, on the parking lot. So th this is where we start to launch into the goals of the council. We're just gonna hit each one very briefly. There's, it's more, there's a lot more detail in the written document that you have. Um, yeah. So Paul and I are going to kind of flip back and forth on some of yep. these. Um, so they're, they're, most of them are broken down into some of uh, funding and then staffing, and there's a little bit of overlap somewhere, some there, some places. Uh, so the capital improvement program, as mentioned earlier, allocates 100,000 for sustainability projects. Uh, we are proposing 10,000 from the American Rescue Plan Act funds um, for an intern to support sustainability. Um, I believe that was a recommendation from the um, ECAC, and so. Uh, we're putting that forward as an idea. Uh, Valley Bike Sharing EV Charging Station. So I know we're, there's grants be, for EV Charging Stations in particular, there's grants being pursued currently. And uh, all the pre-development for the solar project at North Landfill is, is getting completed and that's moving forward. Um, I don't have an exact date, Paul, I don't know if you, but I know it's in the coming months that we're hoping groundbreaking yeah, for that. Yeah, in the fall, I think. So obviously we have staff that are making all these things happen. Well, we're, we've taken tangible steps to move forward on the community choice aggregation program, which the town council has approved. Um, you know, staff are working on the on the development of solar projects, including the assessor. Um, and then the assessors are also working on implementing the PACE program under the direction of the um, finance director. And there's more information on, on some of like the PACE program and the community choice program in the budget book. So community health and safety, another goal. So on the funding side, um, we're probably over this now, but we've expended rough, you know, over $3 million to date on materials, equipment, and services to support the town through COVID. Um, most of that funding has been from CARES or FEMA, and it's still going. So it's, um, it's a uh, frustrating process at times because we have to submit just about everything for FEMA reimbursement, and FEMA does not move quickly. And until we know what FEMA is going to reimburse, we don't know how much of our CARES money we're going to use. Um, we were almost to getting reimbursed for our first request back in June. Um, but in FEMA's defense, they're getting probably, you know, 3,000 um, requests for funding where they're not used to dealing with that many. So, um, but we have expended quite a bit and that supports all departments, schools, library, town. The uh, provided families in need with free meals that we partnered with local restaurants and the bid in the chamber on. Uh, we contracted for a social service support with Outreach of Amherst. Um, this program specifically helped uh, families who were negatively impacted by COVID through potentially um, a loss of a job or having a quarantine or something of that nature. And we are reallocating $130,000 from the police department budget to social services for the creation of a new community responder program. And so the initial funding is based on the work of the community safety working group. And in the budget book, just so people can find it, so that there used to be a social services section of the budget book for the last couple of years, there's been zero funding in it because there were some issues um, with the types of funding that used to be in that section. We have re-engaged that section of the budget. It's under community services and it's called social services. And the only thing in that section right now is this 130,000. Um, and so that was sort of our first uh, attempt at where we thought this program should exist. But again, this is an evolving thing. Um, so we welcome your feedback on that. So I do want to talk about community safety a little bit more um, because that group has been working tirelessly for the past six months 
uh, the work is grueling. It's emotionally draining in a way that I can no never fully comprehend and it's very important. Um, they're working with their consultants to finalize the report. And right now I think they're scheduled to come to the council on May 17th. Um, and just because there were comments made, the $130,000 is not designed to staff an entire program for a year or anything like that. It's going to take time for us to build this program. I mentioned that it hasn't been done before in Massachusetts and I can only find two or three programs outside of Massachusetts where this is done all on pilot and programs in Albuquerque and in Rochester. Most of the programs you see out there are co-responder models that are located in the police department, like the CAHOOTS program. And the, the Community Safety Working Group felt very strongly that this had to be independent of the police department. So that's what we're, we're moving to build on. But it takes time to develop job descriptions, decide what calls are going to be handled by the group, uh, to, you know, hire the folks and um, you know, establish the, the offices where they're gonna work out of. So it takes time. So this $130,000 is uh, set aside to help move that forward and we're committed to doing that. Okay. Do you wanna to touch on this too, Paul? This is, um, so some of this is actually redundant with the COVID, but we yeah. thought that it kind of lives in both places, um, staffing for fire EMS and, and the yeah. Board of Health and the ambassador program. Yeah. Um, so the next goal is racial equity and social justice. So this in FY21, we added 80,000 uh, for diversity, equity, um, and inclusion initiatives and to confront systematic racism. This proposal maintains that for a new round of uh, initiatives in FY22 uh, that will include training for staff and elected officials. Um, and we also, I don't know if it was last year or, or this current fiscal year, became a member of the Government Alliance on Racial Equity. Yeah, so, so here to um, go a little bit off script, the Community Safety Working Group has offered a direction for the town to address the needs that have gone unaddressed. They've recommended $1.1 million to fund and create a Department of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And um, again, we're working with our core equity team and creating the position of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Coordinator to better address this mission. And so that's what this funding uh, from ARPA and taking a current halftime position to try and uh, bolster that, that activity. The next goal is economic vitality. And we mentioned earlier about um, the money to support the update of the zoning bylaw and the capital improvement program. So yes, so filling the economic development director position so that we're poised to surge out of this, the pandemic in a good way. Um, and then we'll also be having staff, uh, i.e. Mr. Mangano, who's gonna be really taking on the parking improvements that have been lying there ever since the community, the, um, the parking working, downtown parking working group has been together. Yeah, it's weird. Whenever I bring up parking, everyone laughs at me. They all give me this look like, yeah, we've tried that before. <laughs> You're gonna do it. You're gonna do yeah. it. So we've got a few more slides here on um, specific economic vitality, sort of projects that are going on. Paul, do you wanna walk through some of these? Sure. Um, so we, um, again, working with, the, this is our planning staff. So they've been working directly with the um, business improvement district and the chamber um, to move forward on a lot of our initiatives um, that yeah, there've been some grants that have been achieved by, that have been garnered by the um, bid in the chamber. Um, so I think there's a lot that will be happening downtown soon. So I think we're gonna walk through these one by one. So the next few slides, um, and Paul, I'll let you touch on, on the next few, um, as we scroll down, are uh, some projects that are in the works and that were mostly funded by outside sources. Yeah, I, th I think that's one of the real exciting parts of our uh, of our project, uh, of what we're presenting tonight, is so many of these projects are being funded by federal, state, or private funds. So we're just gonna run through the things that we have on the, uh, on the list that are either being done or about to be done. And it's a pretty impressive list. Um, so that you already voted to go in a certain direction of the historic North Common. You have a public hearing coming on that, uh, coming up on that to make a final decision about parking and things like that. $1.4 million from multiple sources. We're hoping to get additional funds to uh, either substitute for some of this money or to um, 
expand the scope to allow us to do some of the work around the common to fix sidewalks and um, roads in the immediate vicinity of the common. North Amherst Library, this came through as such a crucial point. Um, a private donor offered to um, help support it and through a, going through sequentially, you know, getting bids, uh, doing design, making sure the designs were approved, were okay with everyone. Now we're in building up the construction um, phase. We will going to be going out to bid and then construction happening. And again, the anonymous donor is very eager to see this going forward. and. and this will should not be costing the town hardly anything. We might be using some DPW crews to help um, with some of the landscaping, things like that. But this is a really game changing moment for North Amherst, I think. The Pomeroy Village Center, many of you were there at the public meeting that we had. Uh, again, a very successful $1.5 million grant from MassWorks to help uh, look at that intersection. That's again is going to be in front of you and for your decision as to whether it, we're going to go in the route of the roundabout or if we want to go in the route of the signalized intersection. The East Adley Road multi use path, we got another grant to extend it across um, to what, South Pleasant Street and then go up uh, Mill Lane to Groff Park. So we will have completed the, um, the ability to walk safely from a major concentration of uh, residents, especially a lot of young residents to the brand new rehabilitated uh, Groff Park, which we're really thrilled about. That's It's a multi-year, some of these things take 10 years. And so this has been an effort for town staff for a long time. So we're, we're so happy to see it coming into fruition. Again, downtown, uh, a, a private park grant or a, a state park grant that allowed us to install a, a um, a playground in, the, in Kendrick Park. It's one of the things that when we're doing downtown things, parents would say, you know, we don't have a place for our kids to go. And um, this will help the downtown become more of a destination. So you can go get your slice of pizza. You can come down, let your kids play while you're, you're um, enjoying your friends and in a, in a safe environment. And I'll just add that there was some uh, CPA funding in addition to this $400,000 mm -hmm. park grant to support that project. Dog Park, another um, grant from the Stanton Foundation to create the dog park on the um, south landfill. And that project is moving forward as well. All right, the next goal is housing affordability. So some of this is things that, um, some of these items are things that have been done recently. So uh, secured 730,000 to create the affordable housing um, future development at Belchertown Road. Um, and that was CPA funding and funds from the Affordable Housing Trust. Uh, there's 30,000 allocated in the Capital Improvement Program for the housing, housing Production Plan update. And there have been allocations of grant funds for rental assistance and temporary shelter initiatives. Some of that out of uh, CARES funds. Some of that I believe was also out of CDBG. So again, we have you know, high level staff who are working on all these projects. Um, because the, these are high priorities for the town, both on the Belcher Town Road, East Street School, uh, and the shelter. And then the last goal is capital investments. So the two pieces on the funding side, um, proposing 100,000 of the American Rescue money uh, to hire a contract for, uh, or to hire or contract for a capital projects manager um, for when we have multiple building projects plus some other large scale um, projects and the enterprise funds going, we wanted uh, a position that could really focus on the day to day to keep things on budget and on time um, uh, and not taking all the department head staff from these projects. And then the other piece here, as I mentioned before, is um, roughly a total of 3.4 million, which would fund uh, design and OPM services for the fire station project and the DPW project. And then the last little piece Paul just hit here is that um, staff have been assigned to support the school building committee. Um, uh, the procurement officer in particular spent a lot of time recently helping with the request for services for owner's project manager, um, putting a lot of time in to move that forward. And that committee is on track. Mm -hmm. 
and Paul's going to wrap it up with how to stay so, involved. Yes. So we have lots of different ways for you to, for people to contact us. Um, obviously counselors can uh, email me anytime and we'll get answers for your questions and we'll share them with all counselors. Uh, the FY22 page is up and we have the engage Amherst page that's active right now. Um, members of the public can email counselors, all counselors at one time with, by writing to town council at amherstma.gov. Um, and all of our documents, every document you see here, plus additional documents, the school budgets, uh, the library budgets are all available at their, our amherstma.gov slash budget website. So with that, we took too much time. I apologize for the amount of time we took. So what other questions you have? First of all, thank you for all of you that put so much time into the document that led them to being able to look at it this way. We're going to uh, just remind you that this is just the beginning of the process. I also want to remind you of what the charter allows us to do and does not allow us to do. It allows us to cut things, but it doesn't allow us to add things. So um, are there council comments at this time? Dorothy. Just a brief comment of praise for the um, expansion of the Amherst, North Amherst Public Library. Um, it's beautiful, and I hope that we get a chance to see more beautiful buildings. Thank you. Pat. Yeah, I, I don't. I guess I'm struggling with $130,000 for the CRESS program. It feels very inadequate. Um, and so I, I just wanna say that I have concern there. I'm gonna be looking at it carefully. Um, I, I just, I heard what you said. I guess I would like to know um, what the process is and that, uh, and to have some kind of timeline uh, to how it will be implemented and, and quite literally, are we actually gonna do this or not? Because I'm concerned that um, we're not gonna follow through. And, and I, you know, I, I don't pin this on any individual or anything, but it just feels like my heart is aching in a certain kind of way. Um, you're, so little given to the program. I, I understand that. I think you're not alone feeling that way. And I'm sure others um, feel that way as well. Um, so there is a design for a program that the Community Safety Working Group put together with a lot of work and a lot of effort. Um, and I think I see that is where they have established where we need to get to, but we don't get there in one step. You know, We need to figure out, again, like I said, what calls are going to be transi transitioned uh, to community responders. We need to talk with the fire department um, and APD and understand exactly, um, we, don't, we can't let calls fall through the cracks. Uh, we need to hire people, we need to train people, we need to do job descriptions for people. Um, as, and the reason I said that it's not been done in the Commonwealth is, is, is not for, not to brag, but to say that is a, that makes it a bigger challenge. If there was a model that existed somewhere and said, do this, that would be so much better for us. Um, and we'd be able to move, turn it around very quickly, but we're gonna be breaking ground on every, on every decision that we make. So it's gonna take time. We are going to be assigning, I am assigning the, our high level staff to make sure it happens um, because we, we, you know, we feel like this is something the council said we wanna see happen. Um, and so we are committed to doing that. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, is 130,000 enough? I don't know. Um, it depends how quickly we, we move forward on it. And we'll look at that as we move forward. Thank you. I just want to mention, I can't raise my hand because I'm a co-host, but uh, Paul, do you see this as an area for potential grant funding? Yes, um, this, you know, there are uh, Department of Mental Health um, has grants. I think there will be a lot, there's a lot of groups out there who might find what we're doing based on the goals established by the working group is to be pretty attractive because it's really different than what other communities are doing. Yeah, okay. Um, Alyssa. My apologies, I didn't expect to get called on so soon, thank you. Um, 
Thank you for the new format. I appreciate that it was a lot of work to consider trying to do something like this in a year like this, but I think it's it's a really creative approach. It took me a few minutes to figure out where Sean's material was coming from. And then I went to the Engage Amherst site and I found it um, because I'm so used to us getting slides of the paper that's in our packet. And that paper's not in our packet because it's an interactive website. So that's exciting. I just want the public to also understand because we had these comments earlier during public comment that we didn't have this budget either. As Paul mentioned, this was still getting refining touches on it tonight late. We didn't get it until during the meeting. So it's not like we, the town council, knew what was in it before the public did, because we didn't. So it's all new to us. And so I really appreciate the highlights you've, you've captured. One thing I will point out, which I suppose in the long run is not particularly problematic because you got the important part, which is the funding parts. But when you transfer the policy goals portion of the town manager's performance goals to pages 24 and 25, and then also in the interactive story, um, it doesn't include the updated date from community health and safety, and it doesn't include the two resolutions. So it was it was using the wrong version of the goals. And so that happens when you have versions of goals, and that's why we started dating our versions. So yay for that. And one thing I wonder if you could speak to briefly tonight, Paul, is that when it comes to the work of the community safety working group, I know we've mentioned that they, we expect that they may be coming before the council on the 17th. But one of the things I've been emphasizing all along is that they're reporting to you, right? And so you were able to say, hey, I was able to go to all their meetings. I know what kinds of things they want, even though the report's not ready yet, right? Because we had this really compressed time frame, And so the report's due for May 15th, potentially coming to town council. But again, they're the, the be all of their charge was not to report to the town council. It was to tell you what we needed to do to do things differently in the budget. And so that seems to have been accomplished. But one point of confusion that's come up with several community members is the consultant's work is not done with that report. That large consulting contract is not completed as of March 15th's report or as of them coming along, or I'm sorry, May 15th report or them coming along on May 17th. There's a whole other section of work that they're planning to do, right? Could you just elaborate on that a little bit? Because some people were thinking, oh, well, they have reported to Community Safety Working Group already. They're done. I'm like, uh-uh, that was just the first part of what they were doing. Yeah. So, I mean, um, so so I do, the, the community safety working group did take votes on specific motions and I mentioned those in the, in the report. So they did take active positions on things and made that recommendation. Um, they are working on their final report and they have a subcommittee working on that. The, um, we recognize that the consultant had a compressed timeline that was known to everyone when the bidding happened. Um, and I think the, the um, they're in close contact, the consultant with the leadership of the community safety working group to make sure that the community safety working groups gets the information it needs from the consultant to be able to build their report over the next couple of weeks. Could I follow up on that? Because I'm still lost. Please listen. So that contract was for over $50,000. It was not for a singular report that was due March 15th. Is that covering all the items that were in the community safety working groups charge, including the whole part two of their charge that wasn't needing to be completed until June? Because right now we're, we're hearing about an 18 page report and that I, I'm, I'm not understanding. Okay, I don't know how long the report is. Um, but the, we have a specific um, RFP that went out for specific things that were focused on the beginning, the first half of the uh, working group's uh, mission, which was the more intensive research that needed to be done. So the second entire part of the charge is not going to be addressed by that consulting group. That consulting group's work will be finished when this report due to you March right. 15th, yeah, I'm sorry, May 15th is done. Yeah, so this this I think this is the police oversight, civilian oversight board or whatever it is um, that that whole part two yeah. isn't going to be covered except in terms of general recommendation. Yeah, I, okay. they're 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 probably going to be. Uh, oh, Joy, um, I'd rather leave it to the community safety working group to explain where they're going to come from, but they I think you will see recommendations about how to handle that as well. Anything else, Melissa? I'm just still a little confused about the charge, but we can talk more about that in the next meeting. Okay, and as Paul mentioned, they'll be coming for the council at our next meeting. Uh, Darcy. 
Yeah, um, I, I just also want to say that um, I think this budget looks way more accessible to the public. And I thank Sean and Brianna very much for that. Um, I have two questions and they, they both relate to staffing. Uh, first, on climate action, um, I welcome the $100,000 set aside, um, though the types of actions needed will clearly cost more in the future, more in like in the millions. Um, the, the funding request of ECAC uh, was for a department level position um, at, based on the number and types of actions that will need to be implemented under the proposed climate action plan. We'll need that type of position to be able to, to implement those actions. And I'm interested in finding out what you have in mind for the um, the $10,000. I, I hear that it's for an intern, uh, but um, I just would like you to respond to that uh, request for a department level position. Also, the community safety working group also requested a department level position and the $30,000 coordinator position is not that. Um, and can you explain that and where this position would fit in and what authority the coordinator would have? Paul, do you want me to take the first part? Yeah. So, um, so, so we haven't got received the official um, resiliency plan yet. So we did our best to try to, I mean, we've seen drafts of it, um, but we haven't seen the official version. So we tried our best to include some pieces into the FY22 budget proposal um, to help with that once it's officially released. Um, but we know, again, that's an area that we'll have to come back to and revisit in future budgets. Um, I know I'm 100 gonna add, surely not be yeah. enough. Thank you, Sean. I wanna add also that as of just today, there was a request to move that agenda item uh, to June because the report won't be ready yet. Okay, Darth, you had another part to your question. Yeah. Paul. So the DEI coordinator role. Um, and so what we're looking at for that is to um, leverage an existing position to create a DEI coordinator position um, and to work in the HR department and with the HR, because that's where we want to focus our activities. Uh, this is a person who's really interested in developing their skills in this direction. And also um, we, I feel like it will be a, a big asset to the town to have, to start to move in this direction. So what, what authority would that person have? As um, sorry. I'm just wondering what authority a coordinator would have. So a, a, a coordinator has a, a role there. It's not a director position. It's just a coordinator position. They have a role to contribute to conversations at all different levels um, to help coordinate act, outreach to areas to try and broaden the diversity of our workforce to also work on retention issues. Um, so it, it's at a certain level uh, sort of, um, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think I'll just add, you know, Paul and I have talked about this. We view this as sort of the start again of something that might evolve into the future. Um, uh, I've seen this work really well at the schools. I'm sure you've heard lots of good things about the school human resources department and a lot of their initiatives um, to diversify their staff and retain staff and recruit staff. Um, and so again, this is sort of a first step and, and we've seen a model here in town where it's worked really well. Right, so I would just add that that is a super important piece of what we're doing with both equity and sustainability as far as integrating it into hiring and training and so on. But we also need, um, uh, we need staff to be able to implement on a, a department level so that they will have, uh, you know, sort of equal status with the other department heads so that they can implement these programs um, easily. It's hard, it's hard to be a coordinator and get the attention of department heads from what I can tell. Um, Alyssa. Mm. 
Okay. Are there any other comments? Okay. Uh, again, thank you. And uh, this will now be referred to the Finance Committee. I really want to urge all councillors to um, make sure that if you have specific questions about various areas of the budget, please note the calendar that is in your packet tonight in terms of which uh, departments and portions of the budget will be discussed on which days. Those um, have been assigned to individual members of the Finance Committee, including the um, non-voting residents of the Finance Committee. And uh, we just wanna make sure that we as counselors on the Finance Committee respond to the rest of the council's questions as we look at the details of the budget. So with that, we are going to move on to the next item, which is um, D, which is the proposed zoning amendment to Article 15, Inclusionary Zoning. Um, I believe Paul and Christine and Nate Malloy are part of this. I'll just go straight to Chris. Chris. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name I is Christine Brestrup, and I'm the planning director for the town. So may I just launch into um, a brief introduction? Um, the purpose of, uh, so Nate and I are here tonight to present the amendment to Article 15 inclusionary zoning. Um, the purpose of this inclusionary zoning bylaw amendment is to require that private developments include affordable units in most residential developments in town. Senior planner Nate Malloy will present the details of the zoning amendment, but I wanted to give a brief history and background as to why we're here. Um, it's really a summary of Paul's uh, memo that he sent to you. Um, since early 2020, we've been working with the Community Resources Committee and the Planning Board to develop a list of zoning priorities that we all agree need to be worked on. Um, on January 4th, the Town Council voted to direct the Town Manager to present a list of zoning amendments to the Town Council for consideration. And simultaneously, the Planning Department and the Building Commissioner have been working on a list of their own zoning priorities, some of which overlap with the priorities of the Town Council. Um, so since January, we've been working with the CRC on an almost weekly basis, well, it seems almost weekly anyway, uh, to develop these zoning amendments. Um, the CRC and the Planning Board have been working really hard. And this is the first one of the zoning amendments that's ready to be considered by Town Council. We ask that you refer this zoning amendment to the Planning Board and to the CRC for a public hearing. The original inclusionary zoning bylaw was adopted in 2005 by town meeting. And that bylaw required that affordable units be included in residential developments that had 10 units or more if they required a special permit. The bylaw was interpreted to mean that developments that needed a special permit for use would be required to provide affordable units. So from 2005 to 2013, just about eight years, the bylaw yielded no affordable units at all. In 2013, presidential apartments on North Pleasant Street needed a special permit to add 54 dwelling units. And as a result, they were required to provide uh, six affordable units. Since 2013, there have been more efforts to amend the inclusionary bylaw to make it more productive in terms of providing affordable units. Article 22 was brought to town meeting in 2015, and that would have provided cost offsets for developers who would provide affordable units, but it was defeated by a vote of 88 to 100 because it was complicated as well as for other reasons. In 2015, a local tax incentive was approved by the state legislature, allowing Amherst to offer a graduated tax incentive for developments of over 10 units in which at least 10% are affordable. Then in the spring of 2018, another inclusionary zoning amendment was brought to town meeting and it was a joint effort of the planning board and a group of citizens who had filed a petition article. Uh, the planning board's version of this zoning amendment was eventually approved by town meeting. Um, and it required that some developments which needed special permits for dimensional requirements, um, as well as for use would be required to provide affordable units. 
It also allowed the provision of offsite units and payment in lieu to meet the requirement for affordable units. In 2018, the zoning amendment was adopted by town meeting and it has been successful in producing about 20 more affordable units. Um, the town has also been able to develop affordable units and other, using other mechanisms such as supporting developers who choose to use the 40B process or comprehensive permits. And examples of this are North Square at the Mill District in North Amherst and the proposed supportive studio apartments at 132 Northampton Road proposed by Valley CDC. All of these efforts have resulted in incremental increases in the number of affordable units in town. Meanwhile, the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust continues to work on development of affordable housing by encouraging the town to provide CPAC funds, uh, Community Preservation Act Committee funds to support affordable housing development. And the trust has proposed that the town set a goal of producing 50 affordable units each year for a period of five years for a total of 250 units in five years. In addition, the housing production plan, which was uh, done back in 2013, set a goal of producing 48 affordable units per year for Amherst. Um, so in order to come close to reaching these goals or even begin to approach these goals, the planning department believes that private developers should have a role in providing affordable units. They benefit from the favorable conditions that allow them to develop property in Amherst, and um, we think they should be part of the picture. So the town manager and the planning department request that town council review and adopt the proposed amendments to Article 15, inclusionary zoning, as a first step of which is the first step of which is to refer the amendment to the planning board and the CRC for a public hearing. And now Nate Malloy will present the zoning amendment to you. And I think Nate Malloy is here. I'm, I'm here, Chris. My, my video isn't working. Um, I've tried shutting down Zoom three times. I'm sorry. I, I, I even got a haircut and shaved uh, for this. So um, I didn't realize my, I, re I think I have to restart my computer and I don't have time for that. No, nope. send us a picture, Nate. Sure. Should I send? Should I share my screen of the zoning um, and just walk yeah. through the zoning? Is that the best? We will actually do that for you. Okay, great. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Athena will be able to put that up. She will be able to put that up on the screen. Thanks, Athena. So yeah, I think the um, you know as Chris mentioned, the inclusionary zoning has been periodically updated. Um, you know, it's been a few years, but. Um, you know, it's been, it was, you know, initially adopted in 2005. And so, you know, staff sees this as a periodic update that, um, that'll just help, uh, you know, create more units and just uh, align the, the inclusionary zoning with uh, what staff sees as priorities for the town and help make some clarifications. Uh, the first one is in the intent and purpose. Uh, and um, the fourth one, it said, uh, Originally, it, was, it had um, local preference for only those who lived or worked in Amherst, but local preference has more categories than that. And so we're proposing just to, to change the language to say, um, you know, the permit granting authority or the special permit granting authority consider offering local preference for new affordable housing as a condition of the permit or special permit. So really just trying to, you know, clarify that any, any of the local preference categories, you know, can be discussed on a project. Um, and then right here for, um, if you just scroll up a little bit, Athena, uh, for 15.1, yeah, right here, uh, regulations. Um, I just wanna say quickly too, that the planning board and the C community resource committee have both looked at this a few times and staff has incorporated the changes through these meetings. So, you know, it's been a, a really, a really um, a nice effort uh, kind of, um, you know, with comments and, and public comments received as well. So these changes, incorporate a series of public comments. It's been a really good iterative approach. Um, and, and so right now, the it, and above, everything in bold italics is new. So it says that um, to ensure the purposes of this section, the following regulations shall apply to residential development, including but not limited to townhouses, apartments, mixed use buildings, uh, PERDs, planned unit residential developments, and open space cluster developments or conservation developments in Amherst that provide new dwelling units. And this is a really big change. So uh, 
you know, uh, the current bylaw is only if the use requires a special permit. And now it's saying, you know, residential development um, and it names a number of those. So many of these included now would typically not be, um, would not trigger inclusionary zoning. Uh, and it says new dwelling units means the combination of units that have received or will receive a certificate of occupancy in any five year period and are located in new buildings or additions to existing buildings and any net increase in units resulting from reconstruction of existing buildings uh, with exceptions. And so this definition of new dwelling units is new. It's really trying to clarify what exactly are new units. Um, so, you know, it's ones that, uh, and, and will receive a certificate. What we're getting at here is that have received or will receive, we're trying to capture projects that may try to be phased, incrementally phased to try to be exempt from, uh, from this bylaw. Um, the exceptions to the bylaw are affordable housing developments under chapter 40B, a conventional re uh, residential subdivision and a cluster development. And a residential subdivision is exempt because really a subdivision is a layout of a road and properties. It's not necessarily the development of units. Um, any uses permitted under section 3.326 in the fraternity residence district. So essentially we have a few properties in town that are under a fraternity residence district. So housing in there would be um, exempt institutional uses um, under section 3.33. And those uses are, uh, for instance, government uses or uh, educational uses uh, like Amherst or Hampshire College providing yeah. residence halls, and then housing constructed by a public agency or non or nonprofit that meets the goals of this of this uh, bylaw. So, you know, we're trying to, um, you know, we have we have clear uh, exceptions to this um, to who would be required to provide new units. Um, further down, Athena and fifteen point one one. Again, we're we're eliminating the special permit requirement. We're saying as up above, any residential development resulting in these new units are required to provide affordable units at, the, at these rates. And the rates aren't changing. So if it's 10 units, if it's one to nine units, there's no requirement. Uh, if it's 10 to 14, it's one unit. Uh, if it's um, 15 to 20, it's two units and over 21 new units. So it's not just, you know, after, if someone's proposing 21 new units, 12% of the units need to be affordable. Um, we're eliminating the special permit requirement or the trigger if there's dimensional modifications because now it's basically any development. Um, there is a new set aside here. Um, when six or more affordable units are required under this bylaw, 20% of those units shall be affordable to households earning 60% of the area median income or less as calculated by HUD. And this is a new provision. So in our bylaw, we define affordability as 80% of the area median income. And so that's that's what the units will be. However, you know, if there's six or more affordable units, which this is essentially a 46 unit development. So it's almost a 50 unit development would then need to set aside 20% of their affordable units at a, you know, a tiered income level. And Brookline does this, they actually have it down to 50% and other communities are starting to do this where they, you know, they have a tiered income. So you can have a mixed uh, mixed income development. In 15.12, we're defining residential development. So this term had been used throughout the bylaw and never really defined. And so um, we're saying now it means new dwelling units on one or more adjacent properties developed at the same time or in phases and that share aspects of the properties such as but not limited to shared utilities, a common driveway, shared parking, or the use of combined properties for lot or building coverage calculations. And so for instance, you know, again, a property owner may own two adjacent properties and they may want to develop them as a project, but they don't, they may not want to provide affordable units, which we actually have, um, has been asked, you know, how can I not, you know, how can I basically be exempt from the bylaw and they might develop it, you know, nine units at a time and never trigger 10 units, but residential development would, you know, would capture this because, um, you know, really that's, that's really one project. Um, the remainder of the bylaw, if you can go to the end, you know, none of that, none of these, um, none of these other conditions uh, change. Uh, one of the recent amendments that Chris mentioned back in 18 was the provision of offsite units or a payment in lieu of um, 
to the housing trust. So initially the bylaw said if four or more units are provided or acquired, half the units could be offsite. And we've increased that to six or more affordable units. So again, this would be for a 46 unit project. Um, if they, ha they have to provide six affordable units, if they provide half of them on site, half of them could either be located off site um, within the same zoning district. And this only applies to projects in the BG, BVC, BN, or some BL district. And we're not changing this. This is already uh, in the bylaw. Um, but what we are changing is the payment in lieu of, we're increasing it from three times the median family income to four times the median family income. And the increase from three to four is actually an effort to um, get to a cost of what it takes to build a unit. So the median family income is about 76,000, 75,000 in Amherst. And four times that amount is really about the cost of what it would take to construct a unit. So, you know, the consultant back in 2015, when the town hired Judy Barrett, she said that these provisions right here, you know, they're still there, you know, it's through a special permit and the applicant has to make a good faith effort to provide units and then make the case why they can't and why they either have to make a payment in lieu of or provide offsite units. And so, you know, we increased the threshold both for the payment and for the number of units um, because as Judy said at the time, you want it to be kind of a higher threshold, um, you know, for someone to be able to, to you know, want to use this kind of this, this waiver provision of providing affordable units in the development. So those are the changes to the bylaw. Um, thank you. Um, but I wanna just set this in context. As you all know, back in the beginning of January, uh, we decided to move forward with um, a variety of different um, zoning efforts. Uh, and that process had been being developed by CRC over a number of months. Uh, the planning department then weighed in and said, here's some other things we'd like you to look at. And they came up with a plan. In addition to that, CRC and the planning department have been actively working with CRC and the planning board have been actively working with the planning department. And so this is the first of the proposed bylaw amendments to come before us. We're not voting on it tonight. In fact, we're not ready to vote on it. It's now our vote tonight actually puts it through the formal process, which is to vote to have it go to CRC and to the planning board who will hold formal hearings and come back to the council with their recommendations about this bylaw. Okay, I just wanna make sure we understand where we are in the process. It's not a bylaw before us tonight for adoption. It has not gone through the formal hearing process by CRC and joint with the planning board. And I believe Mandy Joe, that will take place on the 19th uh, at seven o'clock. Is that correct? Uh, if the council refers tonight, that notice is in the paper this coming tomorrow actually so we'd, we'd have to withdraw the notice if it's not referred but yes the 19th at 7 p.m for iz at 8 p.m for um mo the moratorium and mandy joe on behalf of crc are there any other comments at this time uh, not at this time okay uh questions before we move to a um motion kathy um I just want to say I'm strongly in favor of this, so I understand we're just moving it away tonight. I just have one question, and it's actually um, already in the existing law. Nate, when he talked about 1517 and offsite being just in the um, specific zoning areas, I wanted to know if the payment in lieu of it applies anywhere in town, or is it just in just in how I read this and. I also understand that I heard Chris present on this that neither of these have ever been used. These are atypical of being used, but can you, would payment lieu apply townwide or is it also, I, I would read it as townwide because it doesn't refer explicitly to districts. So it's just a question. 
and it's already in the current law bylaw. So it's me understanding this bylaw better. Sure. Yeah. I yes, it, the payment in lieu of would apply town wide, right? So it's not specific to any districts. And yeah, right. These these um these provisions have not been used. And you know, like I think you know, as when these were added, the consultant recommended that they be kind of high, kind of a high barrier, right? It's almost these are, these are not the preferred, this is not the preferred alternative, but it's a way for a developer, if there really is a hardship for them to provide affordable units in the development, there are these two ways they can mitigate that. But we don't wanna make it so easy as the consultant said that they would opt to use it. So they haven't been opted um, yet. Thank you, that answers my question. And I just, you know, and I agree with you both, both on the way these thresholds are set, but I think you know, the, the goal is to have the units in town. So, you know, in all of Amherst. So uh, these are important features of it. So thank you very much. Chris, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? I don't, not at this time. Thank you. Dorothy. I just want to thank the planning department for I think doing a wonderful job, uh, being very responsive uh, coming up with a bylaw which is clear and understandable and is coherent and it's comprehensive. And, um, you know, I've been in, involved in so many of these discussions and, and this piece, that piece, whatever, and I, I really saw it come together tonight. So I, I want to thank them very much for all their hard work. Thank you. Pat. Um, I also want to thank the planning board uh, for this bylaw. Um, the amendments to this bylaw. I, I just have a, a, a gnawing feeling and, and I'm kind of glad they haven't, it hasn't been used. When you can have offsite affordable units, can that lead to a kind of seg, uh, economic seg, segregation? Um, or could a developer um, move everybody into a certain neighborhood uh, that would, I, I don't know. So I'm just curious about that. Sure, thanks. Yeah, at the recent housing trust meeting, uh, this was discussed and the, you know, the, I think it was the planning board or the CRC, you know, they, right, this provision of offsite units was one that wasn't looked on favorably. And one of the members of the housing trust works for mass housing. And she said, actually, um, that other communities have this provision in, and it doesn't violate fair housing. Um, it could, but especially the way Amherst is written, because it you have to provide the offsite units within the zoning district or within 500 feet of the project site, that that proximal um, distinction, right? That 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 you know because of that, it's actually um, it, may, it would make these offsite units work. If we didn't have that that criteria, right? And developer could then put the units, you know, if they're doing something in the town center and they put the affordable units, you know, on Bay Road, then that clear that's a huge, big separation of the neighborhood. But because we have this proximal um, requirement that, you know, the, the trust felt that that was um, uh, a good thing. And they also actually felt that getting the offsite units built would be better than the payment in lieu of because then you actually have affordable units. And so it's kind of a, it is kind of a, a catch 22. How do you balance kind of these, you know, this, this, these waivers to providing them in the actual project? So the trust, you know, they actually preferred the offsite units because of they still have to be within the same zoning district or kind of almost the same neighborhood. Thank you, Nate. Uh, Shalini? Yeah, I had a question about <clears throat> the, um, there was an email that Jerry Weiss had sent to us about the smart, um, it was citing, one second, I need to open it, hold on. Um, the smart growth toolkit for inclusionary zoning on mass.gov and I don't know if the planning department has responded to that email. And that was, I think, something we had discussed about for inclusionary zoning to be effective, what the what the website is proposing and what Jerry Wise was proposing is that we offer density incentives in lieu of the inclusionary zoning. And that's something that was also discussed in, I think, the CRC meetings. Chris? So um, we have looked into that. There are cities and towns in the eastern part of the state that don't have that kind of offset. Um, 
we don't really think it's necessary at this time. And the other thing is then the, in the BG zoning district, it would be very difficult to offer a density bonus because you can already put as many dwelling units as you can fit. The way I like to express it is that you, you're allowed to build a certain size box at certain height, certain you know lot coverage, certain setbacks, and however many mm. dwelling units you can fit in that box is what you're allowed. So the BG doesn't really allow room for much more density. The only thing it would allow for is potentially a sixth story since five stories mm. is already allowed. And we don't think that mm. Amherst is ready for um, allowing a sixth story in the BG district. So mm. all in all, we really don't feel like um, that that kind of offset is is necessary. We've seen, you know, developers developing um, housing in the area. Um, Barry Roberts has two developments that he's including affordable units in. Aspen Heights has a development on Northampton Road and they're including affordable units. Um, so, you know, we, f we feel like the time has come and Amherst is a real, still a really attractive place to um, develop housing. And, um, you know, we think that this is the, the right time to uh, bring this forward. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Alyssa, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. I literally just put it up. So thank you. Um, could we talk just a little bit more? And I know there's going to be hearing, et cetera, but in this venue about local preference, because I, I understand that it's a hot button issue. I understand that it's complex. I understand that we removed certain words here, but I also know that we've had numerous conversations over the years where some residents have felt more comfortable that if the new affordable housing is for people who are already living or working in Amherst, they have a different perception of those affordable housing units than they do if there is no local preference for that first round of, because and that's the thing we always have to remind people, it's, it's only a first round sort of process. So could you talk to us a little bit more about what the actual meaning of 15.03 is in terms of consider offering local preference and then with none of the explanation that used to be at the end of it? Sure, so you know, there is local preference is you know anyone who lives in Amherst uh, works in Amherst, municipal, a municipal employee, uh, or people who have school-aged children in Amherst. And then, you know, there's, it also includes, you know, for instance, if someone even has a job offer, but doesn't live in Amherst and not yet working. I mean, you know, there's all these ways, but essentially, you know, there's like, you know, families, people who live or work in Amherst. And so those are, you know, if we said just live and work in Amherst, then that excludes families with children, for instance, possibly that go to school in Amherst. And so, and it's really not, it's really the permit granting authority's decision on a case by case basis to recommend local preference. So we, as a town can't say that we, you know, and we're allowed up to 70%. So what that means is 70% um, of the units, right? On the first round of, of lottery of, of, uh, of tenancy can be reserved for people who meet local preference. But every time on a project basis, we have to apply, the town has to write, um, work with the state to prove that we can actually, that we have enough need, enough demand for those units to get up to 70%. Um, so for instance, if a project has 10 affordable units and we say, okay, we want local preference for seven of those and they're for, you know, they're all four bedrooms for families, we have to write to the state and say, okay, based on these plans and this, you know, this information, the census information, we actually have enough need for a need for seven families, for seven units of families. The state could say, actually, yeah, we think you only have enough for five units, you know, 50% local preference. And so um, the way the bylaws change now is just it's offering the permit granting authority to say, okay, let's let's look at all the categories of local preference. Um, and let's, you know, we can go up to 70%. So it's not, you know, it's not excluding anything. It's it's actually broadening what, how we can use local preference. If I could just follow up real quick. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's excellent. And that's exactly what I was looking forward to hearing based on our previous conversations about 132 Northampton Road. The only question I have is associated then with, that's a lot of work to ask the state for that information. So does this bylaw where it says consider offering give the permit granting authority the option to say, eh, that'd probably be a lot of work. I'm not really sure it's worth it. So let's not do it. 
Uh, the permit grading authority doesn't do the work staff does. So we can tell them that we're willing to do the work. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm not, you know, even for North Square, right? For even the comprehensive permits, we have to do the same thing. And so every, every, every project, I'm not, I think, right. So I, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, but I think it's something that staff or the trust would advise the permit granting authority on saying that we want local preference. Are there any other questions? All right, I'm going to read the motion and look for a second uh, to refer the proposed amendment to zoning bylaw article 15 inclusionary zoning to the planning board and the community resources committee for a joint hearing held no later than July 7th, 2021 <coughs> and for a written recommendation and an explanation as to whether the proposed bylaw is not inconsistent with the master plan for the planning board from the planning board to the town council and to the resource community resources committee no later than 21 days after the joint hearing and for the community resources committee to send a written recommendation to the town council and to submit all materials to the governance organization and legislation committee for review of clarity, consistency, and actionability within 60 days of the hearing held by the Community Resources Committee. Is there a second? Anarchy seconds. Thank you. Any further discussion or questions? Seeing none, I'm gonna to move to a vote and I start with Mandy Jo. Aye. Dorothy. Aye. Evan? Aye. George? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Steve? Yes. Andy? Aye. Sarah has had to leave the meeting, so she is absent. Shawnee Baumil? Yes. Alyssa? Aye. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Darcy Dumont? Yes. And Lynn Griesmer is an aye, and the vote is 12, 0, 0, and 1 absent. Thank you. Um, the next item on our agenda is the Promori Village Intersection. This is a first discussion <coughs> only. Um, and so I just, at this point, want to ask Darcy Dumont, uh, Town Services and Outreach Committee, to just give a little bit of an overview of their recent discussion and vote. Okay. <clears throat> uh, we, the Town Services and Outreach Committee uh, was referred the um, question about the Pomeroy Village intersection, whether or not it, the design should be a roundabout or a signalized uh, intersection. Uh, we re were referred it on January 25th. And um, on uh, April 22nd, uh, we voted 401 to recommend the town council proceed with the um, Pomeroy Village intersection as a single lane roundabout designed with consideration of the reports of the Transportation Advisory Committee and the Disability Access Advisory Committee. And both of those reports are attached to the TSO report to town council that dated for the meeting today. So um, uh, all of this is in the report, but I'll just briefly say that we looked at, um, uh, we had two public forums including staff presentations on March 25th and 27th. Um, we had outreach to five different uh, town and town council committees. We um, had a staff presentation at the district five town council meeting, which is where the intersection is. Um, we had a pop-up event, staff held a pop-up event on April 17th um, at the um, in front of Mission Cantina where around 40 residents attended. And uh, we also had staff outreach to businesses 
and property owners and abutters and um, the Engage Amherst webpage. Uh, we had a, there's a special page with regard to this project and a survey. So uh, we did a lot of outreach. <laughs> we did a lot of outreach and staff did a lot of outreach. Um, and I really want to thank staff um, profusely for all the work that they put into this. Um, and to the volunteers on the different committees that put a lot of research into it. So anyway, we, we looked at a number of different issues. Safety, uh, including traffic calming, pedestrian safety, that included people with disabilities, children, seniors, bicycle safety, driver safety. Uh, we looked at traffic flow, um, in particular, the fact that there are delays at certain time of the day. Um, we looked at what, which option might be a better economic driver for businesses in that area, um, which option caused more disruption <laughs> to do the construction, which option um, uh, would create more of a land taking. Um, and we uh, looked, we asked to look at the difference in cost, which we did not actually um, receive that from the town staff. And we also asked about what the greenhouse gas emission impact would be of the two different options. Um, so I'm not going to go into all of those things because they're in the report. Um, we included um, the considerations, as I said before, of the Transportation Advisory Committee and of the Disability uh, Access Advisory Committee. Um, and one of those recommendations or considerations was that the roundabout um, were the town to go ahead with the town council to decide to go ahead with the roundabout. Um, that it would have, it would be, it would have audit, auditory and visual signals for safety, for pedestrian safety. Um, so uh, there were a few remaining questions. I was the one abstaining vote and I abstained because um, I was interested in hearing the answers to the remaining questions. Uh, the remaining questions are in the report. Uh, and um, so that would might be something that the, the town staff would be interested in, in providing at this time. Okay. Are there questions or is there additional discussion from either Guilford or Christine Brestrup? Uh, no, we have no additional information. We, there was some information sent to the town manager on the greenhouse gas effect for building versus not building and the type of intersections. Um, and we haven't really sorted through all that yet. So there's nothing much more to be added right now. Okay. Um, Paul or David, you were also very, oh, I'm sorry, Chris, you have your hand up. So I wanted to just um, mention a few things. We wouldn't be able to have a line item cost of construction for the two options um, right now because we don't have a plan. We don't have a survey and the engineers haven't done any of the engineering work. So it's really not possible to give that kind of a detailed um, cost estimate. Um, in terms of how parking will be affected on each of the four corners, um, I spoke with um, the representatives of Slobody Development. They own the northwest corner and the southeast corner. And I've had a number of conversations with them and Dave Zomek was part of the most recent conversation. And they are um, concerned about losing parking on their, particularly their 479 uh, West Street property, which is the property where uh, Valley Transporter used to be. Um, Oh, they yeah. would lose some, a little chunk of their property and probably as much as four parking spaces. Um, mm -hmm. So they, and they have some zoning issues on their property that would be impacted by, by the taking. Um, so I wanted to mention those two things. 
and I think that's all I have to say. Maybe Dave has something to add to that. David? No? Paul? Okay, Evan, do you have questions? Uh, no questions. I, just a comment. I just wanted to, um, Dar Darcy already said this, but I want to very specifically thank the Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, I hope that everyone had an opportunity to read uh, their report, which was the second report they sent to us. They sent us an original report and then they uh, added to it quite a bit. And um, their work is definitely uh, notable on this. Uh, the TSO put a tremendous amount of work into its deliberations around this. Uh, Darcy should be commended for facilitating all of that work because it really was a lot and a lot of meetings, um, but also the Transportation Advisory Committee, I know at least one of the members is in the audience today, really did a tremendous amount of work and their recommendations, I think really ended up driving our discussion and our final decision. I know I went into this already some biased towards a roundabout for reasons of pedestrian and bicycle safety, but their report is what really sealed my decision for me. And I wanna thank them for the work that they did on that. Um, are there any other comments from staff at this time? Or questions from Councilor Shalini? Wait, Chris has a hand up first. So Chris, did you wanna, um, yes. I can go after. I wanted to mention that um, one of the property, one of the representatives of the Slobody Development is an attendee tonight. And so it would be nice if you could hear from him um, when mm -hmm. we've all asked all of our questions. Thank you. Okay, David. Okay. Sure, thank you, Lynn. Um, I just wanted to mention, I um, and, and Guilford is here and, and happy to have him add anything to this, but as Chris said, we, we have been having ongoing conversations with some of the property owners and or business owners uh, in that, in the, in, the, in the village center. And I think that's gonna be an ongoing process. Um, you know, this is not going to happen over days or weeks, but this is a, a many month process. So there, there's going to be, need to be ongoing outreach discussions, as Chris mentioned, there are concerns, uh, at least from one uh, significant property owner at the Four Corners. Um, we have heard from uh, the owner, I believe you have in your packet, some information from the owner of Sibby's Pizza, again, not a landowner, but a business owner. Uh, I've done some outreach to uh, Mission Cantina and we are supposed to meet this week, as a matter of fact. So I just wanted to put out there that uh, regardless of what decision you make on uh, and in directing staff to move forward with design A or B roundabout or signalized, that outreach and those discussions um, will be ongoing. I know that, that Guilford and other staff worked um, you know, tirelessly through the years uh, when we did the double roundabout down near Atkins. So these are, these are processes that take months sometimes to move forward. And because we don't have a design yet, we really don't know the extent of the improvements that will happen in the village center or that we can afford. And because we haven't done the survey work, we don't know uh, how much of one side or the other of the intersection will be affected. We have general information that I believe Guilford and his staff have provided, but we don't know if, if we're going to be needing 12 feet or 15 feet of one side of the, of the intersection. So I just wanted to put that out there. This is not, it is not fully designed yet. And the process of, of meeting with and talking with and working with um, property owners and business owners will be, will be ongoing as we move through the rest of the year. Thank you. Shalini, you have your hand up, and then I want to call on Alan Sharp. Sure. Yeah, I, um, I just wanted to check in whether the recommendations of the Disability Access Advisory Committee about uh, would we be able to uh, reach out to the U.S. Access Board and uh, implement their re recommendations. Is that something we plan to do and would we be able to do that? Chris, Guilford, David? 
I think that Myra Ross reached out to that uh, group. They have some, um, uh, what should I say, regulations that are going to be uh, promulgated but have not yet been. And um, so, you know, I'm sure Myra will keep us well informed about that. She's brought the, um, she's brought the consultant in or her contact at this group into our email chain with her. And she brought a person who is um, an expert in training people with visual and impairments, how to deal with intersections. So Myra is very good about keeping us informed about what the latest requirements are. So I feel ha pretty happy about that. Guilford. Just a quick note that that board actually is really a recommendation board and it makes recommendation boards to people who make the regulations. And some of the things they do recommend, while it would be helpful, have not become regulations. And if they were to become regulations, they would actually make these projects and many projects in the town of Amherst, because we don't live on a flat surface, a bit onerous. Um, so we try to take the recommendations and make the best we can out of it. So even though they may say something, we have to make it fit into the project. And that's just something to remember. Okay, thank you. Um, Athena, would you please um, bring Alan Sharp, Sharp into the room, Attorney Sharp into the room? And uh, welcome. I understand that. Thank you. I have some comments. You'd like to can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Good. So, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm an attorney. I've been practicing in Amherst for 35 years, and I'm currently the president of Slobody Development Corp. Uh, Slobody Development was started by Richard Slobody. Uh, I represented Richard for about 30 years. And around five years ago, Richard uh, got pancreatic cancer. Uh, he was never married. He never had any children. He knew that he was, uh, he was dying. And he came to me and he came to Dwight Scott, who I think is also uh, on this call. And he asked us if we would run his company for 10 years. His goal was, uh, he, he owns a number of properties in Amherst and his goal was to create some generational cash flow for his niece and nephew who, uh, when he died, were too young to operate the businesses. So that's my role in the business. We're gonna be mentoring his niece and nephew into the business. And so I'm not an owner, but I do have a fiduciary obligation uh, to, the, to Richard's estate and his niece and nephew. Um, just make sure that you know we we are uh, making prudent decisions for the for the uh, for the company. Our concern we've met with we've met we've talked to Chris several times. We've seen uh, the preliminary plans of the roundabout and, and the signalizing intersection. We had a nice uh, meeting last week with Chris and David, myself and, and Dwight. And our, our main concerns right now are are, are the roundabout as it's, as it's currently presented. Um, as Chris said, we, we are, our property at 479 West Street is currently non-conforming uh, for, for, for coverage. And um, the roundabout uh, takes at least four of our parking spots and uh, a fairly significant chunk of the corner of our property uh, at 479. And it also, at 7 Pomeroy, it takes a chunk of our property where our, our um, detention basin currently sits. So our, our concern, our concern with 479 is that is that the roundabout would uh, make our property more non-conforming than it than it currently is. Um, we have uh, right now around 4,000 square feet in that building that we're that we're trying to rent. We're concerned that we're concerned that um, that taking might affect our ability to be able to uh, rent space in our building in the future. We also own a lot um, behind 479 that, that we may um, develop at, at some point in time. With regard to Seven Pomeroy, we've thought at some point about maybe putting a second story on that building. So we're concerned with. The roundabout and uh, the amount of taking on, on, on the corner of Pomeroy also. When we looked at the signalized intersection, it, the, the impact on our properties is much, much less significant 
than what the uh, what the what the roundabout shows what the roundabout shows currently. And so we would ask, you know, we we, we also we've also been, we've always been very collaborative in nature, not only our neighbors with the town. We feel like we've always tried to work with the town. Uh, one of the things that we do, the Montessori school, when they got their permitting, they were required to get a digital parking and we're the ones that provide that parking to them. And so we are, we're, 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 we're concerned that if parking is taken away, that we might not be able to have that arrangement with Montessori anymore, which, which would in effect uh, affect potentially their ability to, ability to even exist. Um, because they're, they're, it's my understanding that their special permit is, con is conditioned upon them having the parking that we provide for them at our, bu at our building. We've also historically, um, Mission Cantina, when they were busy, we've always allowed uh, the overflow of their business to park on our, on our, on our property at 479. So we would just ask that, you know, uh, look, we're open-minded right now. Uh, we haven't seen any final plan. We would hope that uh, that that if it, if it was going to be a roundabout, that it would have a much less significant impact on our property than we, than what we on both our properties that we than what we've already seen. And um, you know, we would ask the the um, the council to take that into consideration um, because obviously, you know, we want to. Um, you know, we want to be able to continue to exist as a, as a business. We're very excited about uh, what's going to be happening down there. We think that the improvements are going to, are any, any improvement, whether, you know, the improvements that are being planned down there are going to um, certainly benefit that area. We, you know, we, we applaud the town and this grant and uh, we're here to work with you. Thank you very much. Uh, Attorney Sharp. I wondered if Dwight Scott also wanted to say anything. No, I, I think Alan, can everybody hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I think Alan covered pretty much of all of the issues that we're concerned about. Um, in, in, in the building of those two properties, I, I constructed both of those properties on each of the corners. Uh, back years ago now and um, in watching the intersection evolve, uh, it seems like that particular intersection, and this is just my opinion, is, is definitely more controllable by left-hand turns and signalization than by the roundabout being able to control for pedestrians there and watching people cross, uh, try to get across the street there. And here again, that's that's the only thing that I want to add uh, to that. I, I'd be much more favorable for the signalization. And I think at that location, it would work better than a roundabout. Can I, can I say one other thing? Yes, sir, please. Thank you. And call me Alan, please. Um, uh, I'm also concerned with, with the safety of a roundabout. I know I heard that um, there may have been some studies that roundabout that uh, may have been a study that you looked at that roundabout is safer. One of the things that we do have is All About Learning has a significant portion of our building at Pomeroy. It's, it's uh, preschool, you know, uh, pre-age preschool children that are there. They, they, they have a playground in the back. I live in Northampton and I come through the roundabout every day uh, that's, at, that's at the bridge and I also uh, I live near the roundabout uh, Look Park. And I, from my own experiences, at least a couple of times a week, there are accidents in the roundabout uh, near the bridge. It's almost chaotic. People, you know, I find that people don't really know how to drive through these roundabouts. There's no real, there's nothing that, that, uh, that causes them to slow down because there's no signal. So I am, I am concerned that the roundabout's actually going to be less safe because at least with a signalized intersection, it causes people to slow down. And, um, and so we are also concerned with you know, the safety factor for our tenants. We thank you for joining us.
both Alan and Dwight and for the, your custodial responsibilities all these years. Um, Alyssa, you have your hand up. <coughs> yeah, so two things, and, and I really appreciate um, those two representatives indicating that they are still open-minded about the process because TSO didn't hear any of that information that the town council just received, that none of that was presented to the TSO before we made our recommendation, although we did go over a lot about safety issues associated with roundabouts, and you see that in the DAC and, and TAC reports. Um, in terms of one of the things that we talked about at TSO that I'm not sure was entirely clear, and of course, this is the first major roadway project that the town council is doing since it's been in place, is that we, you see mentioned in the DAC report, the idea of the design going back to the DAC at each phase. That is not necessarily something just like, you know, every individual word that's in both reports is not necessarily something the TSO said, yes, town council do these things. We were very careful about wordsmithing that, but we did make clear to the town manager and he was in agreement because it's a major roadway project that once the town council makes a decision, which the TSO hopes is a roundabout, um, that it would come back to the town council for additional design review at the various stages that that's appropriate for, just so that it would we'd have another look and also that DAAC would have another look before. So like if it was scheduled for a town council meeting to look at the X percent report, the DAAC would have had time to look at it at their meeting. So we'd have DAAC's report when we looked at it at town council. So it's not just town council vote on this and it's over. There are a few more stages to it and coming back to the, and then having it go back to DAAC before it comes back to the council seemed like a consensus that we developed at TSO. Thank you. Dorothy? Uh, I just want to follow up on the statement about Amherst Montessori School. A, to my mind, an extremely important um, place in the town of Amherst. They have very limited parking and they cannot expand the parking because of the nature of the lot where the building is and I think some, some wetlands. So I, I don't want their overflow parking which is required for their operation to be jeopardized. I just wanted to put a strong word of support for that. Thank you. Um, I wanna note again that this, we are not voting tonight. Uh, but in order uh, for us to proceed with the vote on March 17th, I would like the staff to provide us with some sense of those additional checkpoints where you would be bringing things back to the council. Um, scheduling these things into council meetings is interesting at best, difficult at worst. Um, and so I just want to understand, since this is our first big road project, what those look like and when, not just as so much a time frame, but, you know, you come back because now you have the actual design or you come back because now you're able to tell us what land you have to take. So I, important to me as a counselor, and as somebody who works on the agenda uh, to understand what those are and when, at what point she would come back. Uh, Darcy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I would agree with that, Lynn. And also, um, I guess I just feel like um, one of the things that, that, that the town staff had said from the beginning was uh, that, that they were gonna have one-on-one -on -one meetings with um, the, uh, you know, the property owners and abutters and so on. And, you know, there's a lot of effort in that direction, but we didn't ever, like Alyssa said, we, TSO didn't get that input before we made our recommendation from um, the gentleman who just uh, gave their public comment. And, nor have we heard uh, from a number of the other business owners and property owners. So 
um, I guess I feel like that should be done before the council you know, makes a final vote on it. Um, so if to the extent that we could get that, um, you know, I and you know, I also, I know that you have said that you can't provide some of the other remaining issues, remain, you know, answer the remaining questions, but you know, I just feel like it's uh, some uh, the climate impact issue. I think is very important going forward that we need to be doing that. And if even if we can't get really close uh, number on it, we could get some general estimates um, that you could give us, uh, having to do with the different different. Um, you know, ways in which the two different options have to be constructed. So yeah, the climate impact and input from the abutters is what I would be looking for um, before being able to vote on this. Thank you, Paul. So thank you. Um, the um, one of the questions you, questions you raised was Lynn was when would it come back? And I think what the count what the TSO committee when they voted on it said was at the twenty five percent design phase, and that's before things are really settled in. It's a it's a it's an obvious um, uh, it's a it's a, it's a clear stopping point that engineers are used to abiding by, and then that's um, pretty early in the design process that you can see what it's, it's you start to see things laid out on the ground. Um, of course, you know, Guilford wasn't available at that meeting, but that's that was what um, I agreed to was that the 25% because it's you're not at the 75%, it's pretty much a done deal. 25%, they're still like, whoa, this is going in the wrong direction or something like that for you. That's so that would be the, the time frame for checking in. Thank you. Uh, Andy? Uh, speaking again as a member of TSO, as several others have. Um, one of the comments that was made was about uh, you know, observations about other roundabouts and um, comparing one of the comparisons was to the one at the bridge uh, that was just built at the bridge in Northampton uh, where the intersection of uh, comes in from uh, what is it, Damon Road and uh, Interstate 91 exit. I think that one of the things that we were recognizing is, is that um, there are various types of um, intersections that have circles and a uh, roundabout and a traffic circle are two different things. And the number of lanes um, is one of the um, factors. Uh, and uh, we had substantial conversation with uh, Guilford about that. The, two lanes is uh, makes it much more precarious, which was um, the source of the recommendation that it be a single lane um, roundabout. And the analogy was to make it similar to what is at the north end of the University of Massachusetts campus, which is a very different kind of um, intersection and construction than um, the one that we have down at Atkins, which is two lane and uh, has a very different um, aspect to it. So the, and the other thing is, is that the reason that I, um, I certainly was in favor of it is that what um, traffic circles like the one at the north end of campus serve a, a, a traffic calming function. And that uh, as people approach that intersection uh, from coming up from the, either the south or the north, they can come at a high rate of speed and be tempted at a yellow light to go faster. Uh, whereas uh, at the, uh, with a, a roundabout and a single lane roundabout, they in fact are going to be uh, forced to go slower. And the accident rate um, is one thing at a roundabout, but the nature of the accidents, the serious injuries happen from what research we could find from TAC and from Guilford. 
does happen at um, signalized intersections, particularly making turns. So. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I think the difference between a single and a double lane is very big, very serious. Uh, Shalini. I just wanted to clarify, is it uh, for sure that this property will be losing four spots or is it something we're speculating at this point? And secondly, it may be obvious, but is there a way to, if they do indeed lose four spots, is there a way to give them that lost space somewhere else? The, that's only a speculation on the number of lots, the number of spaces that'll be lost right now. When the survey comes in, we'll be able to better identify exactly what the impacts are. Okay, thank you, Gilford. Uh, Kathy. Uh, yeah, I have a question that I'm not sure whether it's easier or hard to answer or has been answered, but when you look at roundabouts, including the one Andy just mentioned on the north end of campus, um, one of my observations is there are rarely young children crossing the sidewalks, crossing the crosswalks there. Um, every once in a while, you get some students walking and you get some bicycles. So do, where is this intersection? What I'm hearing is, I know the Crocker Farm kids can go down there, there's Montessori. Do, can, is there information that differentiates what's in, in, in the immediate vicinity of the roundabouts that have been studied on how many people walk through it? So not cars through it, but walk through it um, and the type of people. So can you look at those issues um, relative to where the roundabout is? You know, walking back and forth across the street to a restaurant, which you don't do up at the north end of campus. There's There's some housing, it's a question. So I don't have an answer to it. So if if there's any way of differentiating, because I think of them, you know, even when I think of about driving around England or some of the European, the roundabouts are often not in um, as much of a commercial area. They're a little bit more, uh, uh, not rural, but small town, allowing cars are not stopping and crossing and people aren't walking back and forth across. Um, as, so it's it's that's my question. Um, I don't know if anybody has an answer to that kind of question at this point. Right, and I wasn't ex necessarily expecting it, but I've been just watching who, even the one in Triangle Street, um, there's sometimes are students crossing there, but they don't often cross right near the traffic circle. They they some they can go up that where Silverscape is, if they're going to UMass, they can avoid the traffic circle altogether. So just thinking of who who might be walking, what kinds of people might be trying to cross the streets um, in this area. And we heard from one person who has an office near there that they often cross just a little bit north, back and forth across the street. So it seems that there's more, there's potentially a fair amount of foot traffic, um, particularly uh, so it's a que it's my question. I'm not expecting an answer right now, but I think it's, it's something, especially what we just heard about the Montessori kids and small kids being nearby and the housing developments that are nearby. That's it. Steve? Um, I think uh, most of the questions I was gonna ask have been asked, but the one about the, t the one, <laughs> Being an old uh, planning board guy, the one about the creating a greater nonconformity is an interesting one that um, I don't know exactly how to deal with that, but it'd be a shame to let that um, derail this project, especially if the landowners would otherwise be cooperative. So of course I was looking at the zoning bylaw and that particular issue, the lot coverage for that particular zone does not have the asterisk A in it. So that could be repaired by through good old asterisk A, or there could be a contract zone, I think, which is a way of zoning a particular parcel, which is used occasionally. So I think that there's workarounds for that, but I think that's a legitimate question because it does affect any future development if it's already a non-conforming lot. So that's, 
But uh, also, I think that the, the question about where do pedestrians cross, particularly in a world where cars are getting quieter, electric cars quieter than combustion cars, that I think that that needs to be addressed. But again, I, I mean, I think there are so many pluses to the recommendation of the, the, um, the TSO plus the transportation advisory that I, I'm generally in favor of that recommendation. Okay. Uh, I'm going to suggest that we move on. This was only a first discussion. Uh, it, obviously, there's some additional information that if it could be available by the 17th, that would be useful. And otherwise, it may not even be able to be available at all. Uh, so I will look at that carefully as we look at the scheduling for the next time this appears on the agenda. Uh, are there any other comments? And if not, I'm just going to keep moving on. We're moving to, moving to the illicit discharge detection and elimination bylaw and simultaneously the stormwater management bylaw. Both of these had to have a slight change. They went back to GOL and I'm gonna call on George Ryan to just discuss that briefly. Thank you, Lynn. Um, yes, I think it's wise to deal with these together because the issue essentially that was raised concerned both um, at the first reading um, the issue was raised about the language around enforcement as it was written in both bylaws. The superintendent of public works was the sole enforcement agent, and that would seem to prohibit allowing others to enforce, for example, police officers. Um, so this was sent out for review to KP Law, and they agreed uh, with the suggestion that the phrase and their designee be, uh, would adequately address this concern. And so in both documents, what you see is the only substantive change to what you saw at the first reading <clears throat> was inserting that phrase in the places appropriate to allow for other enforcement uh, agents other than just the, uh, the, the uh, superintendent of public works. So that was uh, done and voted by GOL unanimously on April 21. And that's really the only change of any substance in the document you have, in the two documents you have in your packet. Are there any questions? Okay, so the both the um, IDDE bylaw and the stormwater management bylaw are attached to your motion sheets. I am not going to read them. Um, thank you. Um, but I am going to make the motion and look for a second and that is to adopt the illicit discharge detection and elimination IDDD E bylaw as shown on pages six to 12. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, then we're going to start with Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Aye. George. Yes. Kathy. Yes. Steve. Aye. Andy. Aye. Um, Shalini. Yes. Alyssa. Aye. Pat. Aye. Darcy. Yes. Lynn is a yes. Mandy Jo. Aye. That passes 12 in favor, none opposed, none abstained, and one absent. We're going to move right on to the next one, and that is to adopt the storm water management bylaw as shown on pages 13 to 19. Is there a second? Second. Okay, any further discussion? Then we're gonna start with Evan Ross. Aye. George? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Steve? Aye. Andy. Aye. Shalini. Yes. Melissa. Aye. Pat. Aye. Darcy. Yes. Lynn is a yes. Mandy Jo. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. That also passes 12 0, zero one absent. We're going to move on to the district advisory board. And uh, George, I'm turning this back over to you. Well, um, this one's a bit more complicated. 
um, you have uh, three documents in your packet. You have the charge that the GOL is sending to you that it has vetted. You have a sample vacancy notice. Um, and uh, you have the memo that uh, I composed, one page memo. So given all the things you had to read for tonight, I don't know how much of this you're able to get through. Um, but we, I guess we have two motions in front of us this evening. The first has to do with the charge. And so I thought I'd focus on that first. And then you need to make a decision as a council uh, what you want to do with uh, this timeline and process. The, I think the most sensible thing would be referred to GOL. And we would need some guidance from you this evening as to what you would want. And maybe we can even decide that tonight. I don't know. But I thought I'd start with the charge. Um, the charge document is in the packet. Um, the main question at issue that we spent two meetings on was the composition of the, of the board and whether there should be elected officials on it. And the decision was made that it should not have elected officials on it and that it would be nine residents. Um, and that we also would uh, have suggested that there be three non-voting. So nine voting members would be residents of the town and uh, one from each of the five uh, existing districts and no more than two from any given district. And that there would be three non-voting members. Uh, one would be the town clerk, one would be a member of the IT staff with GIS experience, and one would be a member of the board of registrars. Um, the document was looked at by the town attorney, was also sent to Michelle Tassinari. Um, she was surprised to get it. She, uh, her, I, got, <laughs> I, got the, I got caught up in email chain um, and she said, normally she doesn't see these sorts of things. And she's been at this business for 30 years, but she said it looked okay to her. Uh, the KP law attorney looked at it and she had no problem with it. Um, so other than that, I think, uh, I don't know, Lynn, if you wanna go right to that and then we can come back and talk about um, the issue of what to do with this in terms of process and timeline. So I'm gonna make the motion about the charge and that is to adopt the district advisory district dean advisory board charge as recommended by the governance organization and legislation committee report on may 3rd 2021 as presented is there a second second the angelus thank you pat any further questions on it seeing none i'm going to move to the vote on that george yes uh kathy yes Steve? Yes. Andy? Aye. Uh, Shalini? Yes. Alyssa? Aye. Pat? Aye. Darcy? Yes. Lynn is a yes. Uh, Mandy Jo? Aye. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Evan Ross? Aye. Votes 12-0 zero, one absent. Okay, the next one is really um, basically sends everybody, everything back to GOL, but they'd like any input from you at this point. And then GOL would return to the town council in a very short turnaround uh, by June 7th uh, with recommendations for the people that we would then as town council a point to the uh, districting advisory board. Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. So I think June 7th is a bit ambitious. Um, the notice of vacancy hasn't been published on the bulletin board yet, and it must be published for 14 days before any interviews or any appointments and stuff can happen under the charter, I believe, um, which takes us to May 17th at the earliest, which is a whopping about 20 days um, before June 7th. And there are nine positions, that's potentially 18 or 20 or even more statements of interests, coordination and all of that. Um, so I'm, my main concern is about the timeline. So you are asking that we would move it to June 21st? Yeah. But the only reason I'm pushing is because we're already behind the eight ball on this. But you know, I completely understand where you are. George. If, if we're not doing interviews, maybe we could. 
make yeah, I, I, if I may, Lynn and Mandy, I really want to make a strong case for. Um, I mean, this was done ten years ago, um, and I put that link and also that information. Uh, if people had a chance to look at it, um, essentially through CAFs um, and the uh, the then town clerk Sandra Burgess um, reviewed them, uh, made recommendations through a memo to the select board, and then the select board made its decision. Um, when Michelle Tassinari reviewed our charge uh, in response to Sue Adet's request, she was surprised by the degree of formalism. And she's been at this for 30 years. So I would just ask the council to consider, um, you know, we're asking people to basically for three months in, in the summer. So we're looking for a group of people who are going to be here in Amherst for three months who are responsible citizens um, who can commit. Um, and I'm not sure what, process, what good an interview would do um, I'm not even sure SOIs are needed, but perhaps we could we could do that. Um, but if we have to do 20 or 30 interviews, um, just right. So I would ask people to think about that. If that's what you want, that's what we'll do. But it's going to be extremely difficult time-wise, and also I think it's not going to be that productive. Um, we have amended the CAFs, so currently um, and recruitment is important. So I mentioned that in the memo. And right this moment, I've already done some. I urge everyone to go out and just to their constituents. And you can go on right now, the town council, uh, the CAF site, and the box is there for DAB. Um, and that's where it all starts is with the CAF. So we need two things, advice from this body in terms of, do you want um, SOIs? And do you want interviews? I would strongly urge you to think strongly about not doing interviews at least just for the sake of, of time. Um, but I need, your, I need your thoughts on this. Melissa? So I'm the one that pointed George at the old information, of course, because I said, hey, let's not overthink this. So you might remember me saying this at a previous town council meeting. And it certainly did simplify matters when we had Sandra just look at the CAFs and be done with it. Um, and I appreciate that when I said not overthink it, it has now been revised so that it is no longer got town councilors on it. I'm not sure why, well, I went ahead and voted for the charge because we were clearly going to. I'm not sure why we're saying the term of appointments one year. I'm not sure why we're making this into such a huge deal. It took them six meetings to do this last time. Six, not six months, not three months of meeting every week like community safety working groups having to do, well, actually more than three months in their case. It took six meetings. It's not a one year process. And I don't think that we should, I know we just voted on the charge, but I don't think it should say it's one year process because it's not, we're not gonna still be doing it next year. So we can appoint people for a year if we want, but we're gonna end up ending this way before that. This is gonna end at the latest at the end of the year, probably before then. So, when we're recruiting, we need to be clear to people that it's really a relatively short time period, but they do have to be available during this time period, right? If you can't do it in the summer, then you can't do it because that's when, and, and through the fall, and that's when it's going to happen. And so as to how, what type of process we need to use, I'm struggling because obviously OCA had a process and obviously GOL and CRC have different processes now. I'm not convinced we need interviews. I'm not convinced we need statements of interest, but with the caveat that can you talk, if you don't have those things, George, I don't know how GOL runs things in terms of how they talk to people, right? So in the past, when we didn't have this whole series of formal interviews way back in the olden days, people would just get called on the phone and say, you didn't say anything on your CAF. Tell me more about some stuff there, but it, but we have a much more formal process now, right? And so I wouldn't want somebody to be judged on their CAF if they don't get the chance for a statement of interest, they don't get a chance for an interview. So I don't wanna make this un an uneven playing field for people, but I also don't wanna overly complicate this in comparison to a lot of other things that we do. So I appreciate that we're open to suggestions on this particular thing. I just don't know an obvious path beyond, I liked the old one of just dumping it on the town clerk. Andy? Uh, just a simple question. Do we have any idea when the Census Bureau is going to have the data that's going to be needed to make the decisions of this committee? And has that been factored into the schedule 
it's now being proposed. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. George, do you want to answer that? Yeah, we, we have those dates, Andy. Um, Sue has given them to us. Um, the first numbers, she calls them legacy files, but essentially there are a set of raw numbers or numbers that, according to the state census people, um, the DAB can begin to work with as of August 15th. So there will be actual numbers that they can be uh, begin working with by August 15th. There's also training. And again, Sue's not here. I'm not quite sure what that entails, but it does sound like that the members of this body would at least need at least one or maybe two sessions of training. Um, so she mentioned some training. Uh, and then the, the numbers a preliminary would be available August 15th. The final census figures are September 30th. And then um, we have to give a vote and submission uh, by October 30th. So back to um, uh, the earlier point uh, by Alyssa, uh, this body really is only gonna exist from maybe sometime in June or July, or June say to the end of October. Because um, at the end of October, we have to have a vote and send things on. So the key dates are August 15th, September 30th is when the actual census figures are available. Um, and then October 18th is the last uh, council meeting before October 30th. So um, that's the timeline, essentially um, August through October 18th is when they'll be doing the bulk of their work, but there's some training involved before that is my understanding. That, yeah, the, I think the goal is that there is state level training. And in fact, the list is already out and towns are signing up for that state level training at this time. Um, then, and really just learning about how the whole process is done. And then you actually start working with the raw data and moving on through the process. Um, so it, there's a little more involved than just, you know, you get a few numbers and you draw a few lines. Um, Mandy Jo? I think I'm okay with not doing interviews, but we modified our CAF form so that it didn't have any questions about why you wanted a position or anything like that. So I think the statement of interests are absolutely necessary given the modification of the CAF form to give an even playing field to anyone who is seeking this position. Darcy? Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing about the CAF. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, another way we could go is just to have the members of the GOL committee um, have um, some interview questions that are all, all the same and make uh, and call people because uh, there might be a lot of people for, in, uh, you know, for Zoom interviews, but we might be able to just divide them up and call them. So that, and then report back to the committee with their answers to the interview questions. So I'm gonna suggest a modification to that. And that is you, you have the CAF and your statement of interest has more structure to it than just saying, tell us why you wanna do this. You know, tell us why you wanna do this and talk about this, this, and this, and hand us a um, SOI. Um, I, I'm fine if you think you honestly can do this without interviews. I think the burden of the number of interviews is huge. But I also really, in addition, and I've said this in a GOL meeting, so it's not gonna be anything new. I would really like this committee to reflect the, the um, population of Amherst, not just the districts, but our diversity as well in a way that it, literally is representative of the town we are. George? Lynn, I share that, but um, we are going to be limited by whoever fills out a CAF and then submits an SOI. So, mm -hmm. and we're also limited by the fact that the individuals have to be literally from different uh, geographic areas. So you might have someone you'd love to have on a committee for various diversity reasons, but unfortunately, um, you already have that, that you don't have that position available. You only get two per district at most. So um, I would say the most important help you could give us would be all individual counselors reaching out to people in their districts 
uh, that they think would, would be serve on this committee and, and encouraging them with the understanding it's these three months, essentially it's the summer. You're not here in the summer, you can't do it. But if it's something you're willing to do, it'd be a great service and encourage them to, to submit a CAF. And then we will reach out um, to them directly, tell them about the SOI. It sounds like that's something that, and maybe have a series of specific questions they need to address um, and then try to move as quickly as possible. But it's gonna be recruitment. Um, I'll put out the uh, a vacancy notice tomorrow, um, but I don't think that's gonna produce uh, 20 responses. If it's gonna be recruitment, particularly by counselors, um, and, and then you know we'll do the best we can to represent the community. But we'll be, it's dependent on who fills out those CAFs. So I guess I want to ask the question back to GOL. Do you feel you've heard enough from the council? Well, what I'm hearing is that, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that you would like SOIs. You, you, because the CAFs do not provide enough information, we should construct some kind of, of, of uh, request. And that if they don't submit an SOI, they can't be considered. So it's another hurdle. The nice thing about a CAF is once they fill it out, they're in the pool. And then we just, we, the five of us look at it and you know, we talk about them, maybe we consult the town clerk, I don't know, and then we make a decision. But if we add the SOI, fine, that's another hurdle. If they don't submit it, they're out of the pool. Um, interviews, it sounds like people are saying, you don't have to do that. Um, would you allow us to do some follow-up? If, you know, if we had a question about somebody's SOI, we could reach out to them informally, is that okay? Um, that's where I need help. Yeah. I I don't have a problem with that. Darcy? I guess I just can't feature choosing people with whom we have not even had a conversation. Um, because you can't tell, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that you cannot tell from the written word. <laughs> um, I, I guess I, I don't I don't see us not having conversations with these people in some way or another, but um, you know that's well. There's maybe something that you all can work out together as long as I have the permission of the council to do this in a somewhat less than formal way, um, because the old the, the system we've been following, and say for instance for finance, is very strict, um, and uh, we're not going to. I'm urging us not to do that. Um, so if people are okay with that, fine. Um, but Andy Joe, um, I just want to give guidance on the non voting members or suggestions. Um, the town clerks on the charge we adopted is the town clerk, but there are two other ones that need chosen somehow. Um, and so I am assuming, or would this committee, not the committee, but the council essentially suggest to Paul that he reach out to the board of registrars for them to designate someone that just gets passed on to the council and similar for the IT department. Um, or is GOL going to be expected to figure out something with those two non-voting positions too? I think it's an excellent suggestion to ask Paul to recommend that reach out to those two groups or figure out how to reach into those two groups and figure that out. that work for GOL? Happy to have Paul do that. I could also do that as chair, just reach Great. out, whichever. I don't care, um, but that's, you know, so you I, see these folks all the time, so. What I'm hearing is that um, you'd at, use some other additional kind of instrument to get some additional information. Call it an SOI, call it a, a set of interview questions. You may need to have <coughs> some conversation, follow up with a few people but that we are giving you permission to relax the rigor of other uh, nominations. Alyssa? Yeah, and I, I think we are doing exactly that. And I think if you just document what you decided, right, then, then it's clear to everybody how it worked. And so um, even though people 10 years from now might look up your URL as well, but it'll all just help us understand it. And I realize that obviously things change a lot, but I will point out that hundreds of people have served on town committees with no appointing authority ever speaking to them personally before they got appointed. Hundreds and more than a hundred. Okay. 
I'm going to make the motion and to refer to the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee recommendation to the Council appointments to the District Dean Advisory Board, including publication of a Charter 9,11E vacancy notice, solicitation of statements of interest, and recommendation to the Town Council by June 21st, 2021. Is there a second? Second. And further question or discussion, Alyssa? Okay, then we're going to move to a vote. Uh, I believe we're up to Kathy. Yes. Steve. Aye. Andy. Aye. Shalini. Yes. Alyssa. Yes, aye. Pat. Aye. Darcy. Yes. Lynn is an aye. Mandy Jo. Aye. Uh, Dorothy. Aye. Evan. Aye. George. Yes. And that is a 12, zero, zero, and one absent. And that concludes our votes for the night. We are now moving on to, and the reason it include means because we already voted, we already voted appointments on the consent agenda. We are now uh, to the committee and liaison reports. Mandy, Joe, anything from CRC? The um, report I filed was mainly so that the dates were in writing. Check out the report for all the dates <laughs> and all the dates matter. So yeah, we're moving forward with everything. The report's just a basic notification of dates. Are you saying that I should look at the dates in the report for updating the town council agendas? You should have them all already, but this is to make sure the entire council has all the dates for everything that's going on in CRC. Great, thanks. Uh, Kathy and Steve, anything on the elementary school building committee besides the fact that we've been doing a lot of interviews? Um, well, I'll do just a quick summary. We uh, were at the point of selecting an OPM and we have done the interviews. We did short, well, we first we did a short list, then we did interviews and we've made a recommendation for a finalist. And now it's in Paul's lap to negotiate a contract. Um, and that hasn't happened yet. But if it happens, then we submit to uh, the granting authority and they edit what we've written. I won't say it quite that way, but we try to get past the slap. So we're still trying to get to a June 7th decision on an OPM, but it does depend on this negotiating contract. Steve, anything to add? You hit it wonderfully. Got it. We're, we're going to stay on the call because we meet again tomorrow at 7.30. Right, but right. <laughs> we're meeting at 7.30 in the morning to, to yeah. tell the rest of the committee what I just said because yeah. we... <laughs> okay, Finance Committee. Andy, anything else except that we have our work cut out for us? Uh, we have one additional item that we're still working on. Um, when the... Uh, matter was referred to us for the um, audit review committee um, and the, uh, the audit process, the auditor selection process. The request was to provide a written report for this meeting, which was part of the uh, finance committee report. Our work really isn't finished and we're going to have to continue that work as we go forward. Um, through the budget process, uh, spending a little bit of time on it so that we can get that done in an orderly fashion. The piece that was described in the report regarding the uh, committee, um, the, the interview uh, committee is something that we probably need to move on at an earlier date than the entire process. And uh, I think that uh, Lynn has tentatively placed it on the May 17 agenda. So is that to approve the um, charge at that point, Andy? That would be to, we would try and get the charge, the committee charge 
because then it has to go, I think, to GOL too. So uh, we would need to- I'm actually to... gonna suggest that since it's three counselors that I, once we approve the committee charge, that I would then poll the council to see who's even interested in being on the selection committee and bring it back on the 21st and the council can vote. That we don't need to spend GOL's time on picking three counselors. That sound okay. I didn't know if you had anticipated the GOL would look at the charge itself. Oh, okay. Normally we do. Huh? Normally we do look at charges, yes. Yep, okay. Good. The uh, Finance Committee can be advancing that to you fairly soon. Okay. Uh, thank you. TSO, Darcy, anything else? Uh, no, not really. Okay. Alyssa? Do you want to mention anything about the uh, licensing or the licensing commissioners? Why, yes, I would love to. Thank you. So remember how last year we revised the longstanding general bylaw on open containers of alcohol that said no person shall consume any alcoholic beverage nor possess or transport any open can, blah, 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 blah. Through all any of these places, unless a permit therefore has previously been secured from the Board of License Commissioners. And the Board of License Commissioners has come up with those regulations. And so there's a memo in your packet dated April 30th and their regulations are on their website. They did a terrific job of reaching out to other communities and talking to different various people throughout town and exploring flexibility and clarity so applicants know what to expect. And it allows the Board of License Commissioners to look at each application in context. So we should all consider this a win. Thank you. Are there any other liaison reports? George, you have your hand up. Yes. Well, GOL, then you forgot my committee. I mean, I know oh, I've been talking a lot goodness. tonight, but that's all right. It's okay. Maybe I did actually have two things I wanted to say briefly, maybe, and I'm sorry. Maybe it's great. because I've been calling on you all night. That's all right. It's um, But if you'll bear with me just for a moment. One is something we've already done this evening, and I just want to make sure that it's, it's if people have concerns or problems with it, they should speak up either now or later. But Lynn was very gracious in allowing us. Uh, GOL felt, uh, I think, as a group, a consensus that we should uh, somehow acknowledge our proclamations, citations, and commemorations, not just have them in the consent agenda. There's no problem with them in the consent agenda, but we should uh, take a moment and recognize them. Uh, the thought was to have either a council sponsor, um, in this case tonight, it was Mandy and myself, and so um, I did it, but, um, or have the chair of GOL, but it ideally be a council sponsor. Um, just briefly introduce it as I did tonight, and then just read the now therefore clause, um, and if someone's in the audience, perhaps recognize them. Um, we felt that was important. So um, if people just, I mean, it takes up time and I know that's precious, but you saw tonight what we did. And if people are unhappy about it or concerned about it, maybe uh, you know, at some other point they can express that or even tonight. But I just wanted to touch base on that briefly. And then the second thing is that uh, GOL will continue to work in addition to working on the DAB process. We are still working on the possibility of creating a a town a council policy on appointments, putting it very briefly, a town uh, for the for council, for all council appointments, at least for um, those for finance, ZBA and uh, uh, planning. And we have a document in our uh, uh, folder for, uh, for Wednesday's meeting, actually two, one's redlined and one is clean uh, that we'll be working with uh, uh, on Wednesday, trying to make some headway with that. Um, it will come after we work on DAB and a few other things, but it should get uh, dealt with on Wednesday. So if people are interested, um, they should definitely look at that document. And if they want to come to the meeting, they're certainly welcome. Um, it will be in the second half of the meeting um, at the moment. But we are still working on that uh, sort of a, on a council policy for appointments. Okay. Dorothy, you have your hand up. Um. Quickly, I really do appreciate the nod to the uh, proclamation at the meeting tonight. And a question, do we submit these to the Gazette each time we have one? We post them on the town and we now do a news release with them. And so uh, they are, they're available to the Gazette but the Gazette can choose not to publish them. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. Any further liaison reports? Did I miss anybody else's committee? Okay. Town manager report, Paul. Um, I don't really have anything to call out. I will be meeting with TSO. They usually have a series of questions at TSO, but if there are any questions from the council, I'm here to answer them. Are there questions from the council? Darcy? Yes, I have, let's see, two questions, if I can find them. Um, oops, wait a minute. Uh, one is about the report about the, the bid Oh, the bid grant. Um, you mentioned uh, that they were going to lease the most prominent, largest building downtown. <laughs> and I wondered what that is. And um, I also had a question about the um, Board of Assessors. Um, how will the Board of Assessors obtain clarification of the council's goals for the residential exemption study? Those two questions. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. He's muted. Close muted. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm not sure if that location is public. I can ask the bid if it is, and if it is, I can share that with you. Um, the um, in terms of. Uh, what they what the board of assessors plans on doing is I think after the last year, the council expressed interest in the residential exemption. They were going to look into that, see what the options were, and then present the options back to the council, and perhaps with a recommendation. Right, you had said that they want to find out from the council what our goals are. So yeah, they they will probably write to you if that's what their interests are to find out what your goals are. Um, I have to follow up on that, I'm sorry. Okay. Darcy, anything else? No, that's it. Pat. Thank you. I, uh, Paul, I'm wondering where uh, you are in um, appointing, uh, creating the task force to look at the shelter situation mm -hmm. and also about what's happening with the shower? Um, I know there's a lot of correspondence this afternoon on the shower. I don't know. I think there's a meeting tomorrow at noon at the site uh, with the building commissioner and a few other staff members with Kevin. Um, so I don't, I'd have to find out where that is, but I know they're actively working it. There's different options available. Um, the committee, I've, I've, I've recruited a number of people who are willing to serve. I've got like one more seat to fill. So it's, a, it's gonna be a very strong committee, I think, uh, that we focused. I've got representatives from the trust, from the Craig's Doors, a um, couple staff members, and then there are a couple other people I'm trying to recruit in who have specific skill sets that are gonna help that Thank group. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions of the town manager? Okay, then we're moving on <coughs> to the town council comments. Um, I gave, I sent out a um, updated, uh, it was updated at the time I sent it and there's since been changes, uh, a set of basically looking at our meetings between now and the end of June. Uh, I did ask individual chairs to basically look at that and let me know if there are changes and so are there any questions on the future agenda items? Pat? No, I was putting my hand up for a comment uh, for something else. Sorry. Okay. That's fine. Uh, then I also sent you my president's report. Are there any questions on that? I, uh, and then let me just mention on future agenda items, um, there's been this ongoing back and forth about a potential parking garage and also the uh, parking shell, I mean the, I'm sorry, the shell on the common. And I would like to uh, work with the town manager to see how we bring those forward. Uh, since I think they're both, they both have been on the plate and then kind of then been a little off the plate uh, as future agenda items. Alyssa? 
Yeah, my question was just, and, and I had sent this to you, Lynn, but I guess I don't understand as a town council where we're at in terms of uh, talking with UMass about the P3 projects, because I appreciate that that you've met with them and Paul meets with them and they've talked about that and they sent out a press release in March about where they are and we know that they still have several steps to go before it gets approved by the board of trustees. But just because we as town councilors get asked a lot of questions about this, it's not clear to me that since the town council has zero role in making any decisions associated with this, how can we best keep the town council kind of so we all have the same information as they get it? Or, you know, if there's something that you get that you want to send to us in an email or Paul gets that Dave gets or however that works, just so that when we get questions, district meetings, people just calling us and asking us where they're at, that just seems like it would be helpful because they're not going to put out press releases as often as one might like. Paul actually has a fairly uh, robust, not well, a fairly good summary of what we do know in his town manager's report. And then I think I sent all of you the link of the recent uh, press release. We don't really know anything beyond that. I mean, we've seen some potential building I concepts that are not even designs. Uh, there's an, a graduate uh, dorm and an undergraduate dorm or living quarters, I should say. And then uh, with the idea that those would be completed by the fall of 2023, and they're placing a higher priority on North Village with the idea that that would be ready for occupancy in 2022, fall of 22, okay? Um, I will see what else, they, they still have to go through some additional approval uh, with the Board of Trustees of the University. And that's not gonna happen until September. Um, but I think that's about all we know. Pat? Yeah, um, I just wanted to remind uh, everyone that we have the Rethinking Racism half-day follow-up this Saturday from nine to 12. And uh, we will be breaking up for a variety of different discussions and we'll be in small groups to do that. Um, so. Anyway, look forward to seeing you there. And you'll be sending a link to all of us for that. Yeah, well, Annie will, yeah, yeah. Connectivity, okay. Yeah. Uh, Dorothy. Um, in reference to UMass um, dorm building, um, I guess it was the press release had an interesting statement in it that once they get these new dorms up, they then would decommission existing dorms to do needed renovation, which is very reasonable. But so I'm interested in net number of new units because it may be, there are no, no new units. They just may be replacement temporarily until the refurbished older dorms get come up. I think that's kind of relevant. I don't, I personally don't have an answer to that, Paul. Maybe we can try to get an estimate to the extent possible. I do know that in a variety of different ways. In fact, a, a office building that was actually an old dorm built from World War II returning vets um, was a building that my office was in and they basically used this swing space whenever they were gonna renovate somebody else's offices. That was after they kicked us out. So, um, you know, they do that, but the, we might be able to get more firm numbers for you, Dave. Steve? Yeah, so on that same topic of um, P3 and development in that area. So a couple of comments. So um, I'm on the campus planning committee, which is a faculty. I have, you know, obviously a UMass employee. So I'm on the UMass campus planning committee as is Chris Bresrup actually. And the developers presented the work for that. And the developer made the comment that she had never seen as many undergraduates living in family houses than she had in Amherst. So I asked the question, I think I've communicated this to some of you, but I asked the question, then why aren't you going bigger? So in other words, if we, if you think there's a lot of, um, and she wasn't saying that as a compliment to the town of Amherst, she was seeing that as a sign that there was a lot of pent up demand for, you know, basically on campus housing, but students couldn't find it. And therefore they were living in houses that were typically owner-occupied. 
So my question is, why not go bigger, 1,200? Because we're only building on one of the parking lots. So um, I think the point I'm making is that I'm, I was a rogue actor <laughs> acting in my capacity at UMass, but I think that there could be a coordinated response from the town, and maybe there is, but I'm not aware of what that might be. But I do think that while we don't have direct jurisdiction, we definitely have influence. So in other words, and actually the same developer talked about, there's a carrot and a stick. So the town can be doing things that encourage, you know, if we think it's a good idea, you know, students to live closer to campus or on campus. Wait, is that the stick or the carrot? Whatever. So, so that's one point is that I do think that we as a town leadership can influence you know, decisions that UMass is making. The other one that I was gonna mention is the Newman Center. So the Newman, the town bought the Newman Center. I'm sorry, the university is buying the Newman Center and in turn leasing land on their campus for a new Newman Center. So that was also presented to us. And that's a really weird situation because it's not, neither under the university jurisdiction per se, nor the town jurisdiction. So it's, they're leasing the land but they're giving the Newman Center complete, um, what do you call it, uh, freedom in terms of what the design is. So, but because it's on university land, then the town has no jurisdiction. So the university doesn't have jurisdiction over the design of it or because they've just drawn a line, said, do whatever you want. But then the town can't get involved in site plan review, special permit. So in fact, they said that they weren't even clear who the building inspector would be for that. But so that's the first time I've ever come across that a reasonably significant project that didn't have clear jurisdiction, either being the university or the town. Okay. That's it. Any comments on that? This point? I don't see any. Are there any other comments or questions regarding uh, future agenda items or counselor comments in general. Steve, you still have your hand up. Okay, seeing none, then I am going to call this meeting adjourned at 11 12. Have a good evening. Thank you.